What a year it's been. Explosive elections, more celebrity deaths than a terrorist bombing at a drug rehab clinic, and a slew of game releases that ran the entire spectrum of awful, bland, and grudgingly okay. Hence the annual Top and Bottom 5, joined once again after last year's show-stopping, well, show-prolonging debut by the Mediocre 5, which to my mind is far more representative of the industry anyway. You'll find neither Call of Duty nor Battlefield on any of these lists, if only because it's getting too obvious. I could repeat that Call of Duty is crushingly mediocre, but I could more profitably use the time to smack myself on the forehead with the flat edge of a trowel. I have a rule to never allow into the top five a sequel that's only good because it's more of a thing I liked before, which is why you'll note a mysterious absence of Dark Souls 3 on this list. However, I'd hate to miss an opportunity to remind everyone that Dark Souls rules, so I'm giving fifth best spot to Salt and Sanctuary for reminding me of it. It's Dark Souls but 2D, and therefore much easier to push through a gap under a door. On the bland games list, meanwhile, more of the same sequels can come in, make themselves at home, settle into their favourite armchair, and bore the grandkids to death as much as they want. So step up, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Deus Ex Human Revolution was Deus Ex but not as interesting or clever, and the developers of Mankind Divided apparently decided that what was bringing down its predecessor was that too much stuff happened in it. <laughs> I suppose the fact that the very first game I reviewed went straight into the bottom five should have been read as a bad omen for the year, more so than that fucking gorilla, anyway. Devil's Third was monumentally stupid and apparently designed by a schizophrenic with vibrators for thumbs, but it shall only skate at the edges of the bottom five for at least being weird enough to briefly distract one from, say, a recent bereavement or loss of limb. After Titanfall 1 dared to show its face on the full price bin with no proper story campaign, the fact that Titanfall 2's story campaign turned out actually surprisingly good somehow becomes all the more damning. Why'd you hide that light under a bushel, Titanfall 1? We've already got clunky multiplayer shooters up the arse, but the pile of decent narrative gameplay experiences barely reaches the ends of our bum hairs. Normally the bland games list is a place for the games that push no boats out and wallow in the basically functional like a toddler in a fully loaded nappy, but Quantum Break did innovate by hybridising a game with a linear TV show, so not so much pushing the boat out as dragging it up the beach and turning it over to project shitty sci-fi channel originals over the hull. I'd advise Remedy to just make films if that's all they're interested in, but I have a feeling they'd be kinda shit. <laughs> Fourth worst is the first of two entries today that I like to collectively call Nintendo's prolonged public suicide. But you know, I've slightly mellowed to Metroid Prime Federation Force of late. They just wanted to try something new, right? Make a game that isn't atmospheric like Metroid Prime, explorative like Metroid Prime, or helmed by the strong protagonist of Metroid Prime, but call it Metroid Prime anyway. That's innovative, I suppose, in the sense that the atomic bomb had some innovative ideas about civic restructuring. <laughs> An interesting loophole in my no-lazy-sequels-to-games-I-already-like rule is that it doesn't apply to blatant rip-offs of games I already like, especially if it's a bit better than the game I already like. I'm talking about Stardew Valley. It's all the mind-numbing workaday, let's tentatively call it fun, of Harvest Moon, but bigger and on Steam. There's never been a better time to stand behind a cow and make highly suspicious thrusting motions. The second Nintendo game on the list only made it to third blandest, as the worst games list requires that I get at least slightly worked up, and the donut of my interest in Paper Mario games can only get heartlessly stamped on once or twice before all the jam has been squirted out. That's what you are, Paper Mario Color Splash. You are the last pathetic dribble that oozes from my once squirty donut. <laughs> I always thought games lay on a straight line spectrum, good games at the bell end, bad games at the pubes, and merely boring games in the veiny shaft, but it turns out sometimes boring can go so far that it comes out from the shaft and curves around to the pubes like a scrotum of ennui. Basically what I'm saying is that The Division is a phenomenally tedious ball sack, so unending and vast that if pressed against the face it could euthanise a vegetative spouse. <laughs> But let's get away from puerile cock metaphors and discuss a game about waving your long thing around so that it smacks into scantily dressed women. Fury, by no means a huge game, but big enough to do everything it needed to do. Full marks for the quirky and compelling characters, for challenging varied boss fights, and for pragmatically cutting out the usual bullshit that goes in between boss fights. No marks for spelling, though. Sometimes I feel like doing a top 5 most Ubisofty sandbox games as well, because if I were less restrained, it and the bland games list might end up interchangeable, but I decided I'd keep it to one, and that one is Far Cry Primal, this year's exemplar of Ubisoft sandbox blandness, now that the division has moved to the big leagues. Reveal the terrain, collect bollocks and invade strongholds, then for a change of pace, invade the terrain, reveal your bollocks and collect someone to hold you strongly. <laughs> VR is still in its experimental phase, and like CD-ROMs in the 90s, that means breaking new ground in terribleness. And CD-ROMs didn't make you physically ill unless you wired the spinning mechanism to your chair by mistake, but Batman Arkham VR is a rare kind of terrible even disregarding that. 30 bucks for a Batman experience equivalent to gluing Batman comic panels to your spectacles and locking yourself in a port-a-loo. <laughs> 
asked, let's give Doom the best game trophy and give myself the England cricket team award for totally unsurprising results, but it was a generally shitty year, as George Michael fans will attest, and I'm not as enthused about Doom as I was with Undertale. I couldn't see myself sulkily ending a friendship with someone because they weren't moved to tears when the Doom Marine snapped off the Cyberdemon's left horn and shoved it up his icon of sin. Oh, how the internal debate raged as to whether this belonged in the worst or blandest list, but in the end, no passionate hatred can be sustained for a game in which you can spend ten minutes pruning a giant pillar of rock with your colourful piss stream and not be entirely sure of how you profited from the venture. No Man's Sky, more like no game. That wasn't your strongest attempt at wordplay, Yarts. No worries, I'll just patch something better in later. <laughs> But it takes something special to top the worst games list. Bugs, bad design and awful story are but single ineptitudes. When the game was obviously a bad idea at the concept stage, its eventual release requires a perfect sequence of bad decisions, or what physicists call a cock-up cascade. Homefront of the Revolution started with the idea of making a sequel to a wish fulfillment for assholes modern shooter, and the resultant cock-up cascade was like watching a chihuahua in a dog wheelchair trying to descend a spiral staircase. I remember a time when the word free always had positive connotations. Free food, free drink, the city of Paris is free of the Bourbonite menace, and if you follow the signs for free candy, it usually resulted in making many interesting new friends in the back of an unmarked van. But not anymore! Now I regard the word free with immediate suspicion, yet another word ruined by the world of video games, alongside other once perfectly good words like connect and virtual and molyneux. So you can imagine my mixed feelings when a free-to-play game comes out on the PS4 with the name Suda51 hanging off it, a word that hasn't yet been ruined for me. If you're just joining us, Suda51 is a Japanese game director inexplicably named after his car license plate, who made his name with quirky alternative post-punk games like Killer7 and No More Heroes, but in his more recent games, to my mind, has been trying a bit too hard to live up to that reputation. The words lollipop and chainsaw spring to mind. Let It Die kicks off with a skateboarding Grim Reaper wearing funky sunglasses, which is an image that leaps straight off the front cover of the complete dullard's guide to creativity. See, it's a traditionally grim thing, acting in a lively and light-hearted way. That's almost as clever as putting a hat on a dog. Shit on a midshipman's biscuit, a dog in a hat? Dogs don't wear hats! I hope the government are keeping a watchful eye on this dangerous subversive. Anyway, Let It Die is a roguelike survival action adventure. This is fun, isn't it? Let's throw out a few more words that don't actually mean anything. Blinking Kangaroo Stovepipe. Alright, it plays like a cross between Dark Souls and Zombie U, with a dash of Manhunt sprinkled on the top, represented mainly by unnecessarily violent finishing moves with improvised weaponry. Hey, we're smashing someone's face in with a steam iron! That's not a thing traditionally done with a steam iron! Someone put that crazy Suda51 on the terrorist watch list before he breaks wind in front of the Queen or something. You play a succession of men and women dressed like an Olympic swimming team that got about one-fifth of the way through being assimilated by the Borg, and your task is to fight through all the levels of a mysterious tower in order to get the prize, the prize being not having to fight through the mysterious tower anymore. Combat is superficially Dark Soulsy in that it's based around stamina management and whiff punishing, which incidentally is one word the video games hasn't ruined and I think we should invent more meanings for whiff punishing just so I can use it more often. Darling, I'd like to make an omelette, would you mind whiff punishing some eggs for me? But I know my Dark Souls, and you, sir, are no Dark Souls. The thing about Dark Souls combat is that it's best suited to one-on-one, -on -one. you and your opponent trying to wriggle around each other like a pair of hedgehogs ballroom dancing inside a tube sock, but Let It Die constantly makes you fight groups of two or three. Mind you, the enemies can damage each other so I'd just keep dodging and let them accidentally clip each other to death, which works but just isn't as satisfying as the proper way, like hammering in a nail with a saucepan. Also, and you might want to get a pencil because this is a fairly technical suggestion, it'd be nice if the dodge button actually fucking worked, when the game's going, well he got you with the first hit of the combo so you might as well keep standing there sputtering indignantly while he does the rest of it. The game also assigns more than one command to some buttons, like it's passive aggressively trying to get them married. You throw your current inventory item by touching the trackpad and eat it by touching the trackpad in a subtly different way, and I'm sure you can imagine there is very little overlap between things you want to throw at people and things you want to eat. The list starts and ends with custard pies, and there aren't a whole lot of custard pies in the Tower of Barbs. You also cycle your inventory by touching the trackpad in a third subtly different way. Blimey, this is like trying to seduce your lady friend in a darkened cinema and discovering that all along you were fingering her bacon sandwich. Maybe it's part of the challenge, but the primary challenge in a free-to-play game is figuring out when and how the game is going to start stinging you for dosh. Because it's unusual for a single-player game to be free-to-play, at least one that's not aimed at housewives with empty nest syndrome, or kids with itchy micropayment fingers. And yes, Let It Die is a single-player game, don't let those international leaderboards fool you. There's an ace synchronous multiplayer sort of arrangement wherein you invade other people's hub worlds and wreck up the place for cash, but you can't interact with other players directly, you only fight the random johnnies they assign to defend themselves, and it's no different to fighting the random johnnies in the actual levels, except instead of fighting them in samey environments, you fight them in the same environment, a subtle but crucial difference, I'm sure you'll agree. You don't even get better stuff from doing it, so I'm not sure why you'd want to, except that you get to imagine another player somewhere in the world shaking their tiny fists in impotent rage, which sounds petty, but it's the kind of petty satisfaction you need after you yourself have had to shake your tiny impotent fists because someone broke into 
into your hub world and whittled in the drinking fountain. So let's get back to the actual game and how it stings you for micropayments. See, micropayments for buying continues to keep going after death, and you get a generous free sample of those that lasts just about long enough for you to start getting invested. But I didn't realise you're not actually supposed to be getting invested. You're supposed to, quote, let it die. See, once you hit level 10, you're supposed to ditch your current favourite avatars and start levelling up new higher tier ones with better stats, level caps and go faster stripes, so you can tackle the new batch of levels without getting your face steam ironed onto a hilarious souvenir t-shirt. I didn't know that, and I noticed the game wasn't in much of a hurry to inform me of that, as I blew all my continues trying to get my tier 1 character to level 13. Perhaps it's churlish of me to expect a free game not to try to cover its costs, but this was also the point where the game started getting grind delicious. You see, after my best character died and I had no continues, I needed to pay in-game money to resurrect him instead, for you see, permadeath is only a thing that poor people have to worry about. But to make that money, I had to grind with my second best avatar, but his stats were lower and I got him killed as well, so I had to grind up with my third best to bring him back so I could continue grinding up to bring my best one back, and that's when I knew I had to get out, before I got caught in an inescapable vortex of failure. I learned that lesson from the Hillary Clinton campaign. So now that we've finally hauled ourselves out of the Christmas period and the usual quagmire of familial tension where all the chocolates exist in some strange dimension out of phase with the rest of the universe because everyone's too polite to start eating them, let's now immediately remind ourselves of it by playing Dead Rising 4, aka the Dead Rising Holiday Special. Setting a game at Christmas is the perfect method for drastically reducing its shelf life, especially for me, that fucking sleigh ride song is irritating enough without having to listen to it constantly while browsing for gifts in a shop only tangentially related to sleigh riding. It's possible that playing Dead Rising 4 in New Year catch-ups time is doing it a disservice, and if anyone does think that, they better hold on to their trouser repair kit for the disservice the rest of this video is going to do, as I think I understand Capcom's thinking here. Hey, let's make Dead Rising 4 a Christmas game, some bold visionary must have said. That way, everyone will be playing it through a haze of food coma and Bailey's Irish cream and won't notice it for the pile of steaming reindeer nuggets that it is. In fairness, most of that is in comparison to previous Dead Rising games, for Dead Rising 4 seems to consist entirely of bits of other Dead Rising games torn off in fistfuls and strung together with Christmas lights. Recurring Dead Rising hero Frank West recurs once again, now sporting a slightly different face and voice and having apparently devoted his life to becoming a faintly desperate tribute to Bruce Campbell's career-making performance in the Evil Dead films. He's dragged into a fresh batch of zombie hell by an over-eager student seeking to expose the government conspiracy, for as has long been established, the government of the Dead Rising universe has a bit of a one-track mind and sets off zombie plagues to deal with everything from intelligence leaks to lapses in state education funding. But Frank and his protege have a falling out because Frank insists on not getting involved in the story, a policy he states firmly while he's smashing a few roomfuls of the newly undead into the skirting boards with a bit of old pipe, and he ends up alone in the latest outbreak trying to track her down, driving armoured bulldozers through crowded streets in order to not be involved as efficiently as possible. The first thing you need to know is that Dead Rising 4 doesn't have a fixed time limit or mission deadlines. You remember that thing that every Dead Rising has and what makes them interesting, and is as much a part of Dead Rising as the sense of betrayal is part of getting kicked in the balls by your beloved horse. What it does have is a linear sequence of missions that will still be waiting for you even if you sit down in the mud outside and make daisy chains for 11 hours. You remember the way every bloody sandbox game works. Dead Rising has taken the path of innovation that entails doing the shit that everyone else does, which is innovative in the same sense that the grey goo scenario is innovative. Oh wow, my legs have been harvested by a ravenous unstoppable nano swarm. This will add an intriguing new twist to the upcoming line dancing tournament. I shouldn't have to explain that the time limits were there to add a unique challenge. Yes, it could occasionally get in the way of trying on hilarious barbecue aprons and tricycling down the escalator, but isn't that cathartic fun all the more satisfying when we know we've parceled our time to allow for a quick barbecue apron session in between making progress and aren't just cocking about? I got through the entirety of Dead Rising 4 without dying once, and while I'd love to attribute that to my finely honed thumb and finger skills that are why they now know me downtown as Yahtzee Croshaw the weapon of masturbation, I think it's more to do with the fact that this game is mostly cocking about, that you get an over-generous 500 point health bar right off the bat, and it feels like every food and healing item fills it up most of the way. And on that note, inventory is now divided into types, so you can have a healing item, a thrown item, a melee weapon, a ranged weapon, and your preferred genre of pawn all at your hands at the touch of a button. Which is all very convenient, but convenient is one of the words that doesn't belong anywhere near Dead Rising, alongside restraint and permanently exclusive. If all you want is the catharsis of splattering thousands of zombies with weapon and vehicle combos copy-pasted from the last two games to a Merry Holiday soundtrack, then I suppose Dead Rising 4 offers that at least, but you could get the same experience from pouring 500 baby chicks into a meat grinder and putting on It's a Wonderful Life in the background. Now, doing nothing but comparing Dead Rising 4 to its predecessors would be a stubborn, churlish and counterproductive thing to do, so let's keep doing it. Hey, remember how the boss fights with psychos used to be elaborate and interesting with colourful characters and unique attacks? Well instead of that, now you fight generic dudes in silly outfits with slightly longer health bars. Another wonderful innovation to the format. Oh look, the Grey Goo scenario has eaten my arms now as well. What a perfect opportunity to learn how to balance things on my nose. Alright, fine. Dead Rising 4 introduces a couple of new mechanics. You can equip powered armour in order to continue doing the same zombie splattering you've been doing all along except with slightly more defence. And there are stealth mechanics now, and holy shit, I just thought of another word that doesn't belong anywhere near Dead Rising. Stealth is for characters who aren't carrying around three dynamite crossbows and a giant acid spewing hammer, thank you very much. To me, stealth mode was just a walk obnoxiously slowly button that I only ever pressed because I forgot that it wasn't the sprint. So many bugbears in Dead Rising 4, but the biggest and sweatiest one for me is that it's reduced everything to generic random encounters, where in previous games every 
Psycho and Discordable Civvy was unique. Even so, perhaps it could at least have been dismissed as a cheaply knocked out Christmas special with a plot generic enough to be safely discounted from the canon, were it not for one thing. Time for a great big ending spoiler, so if you're waiting for Dead Rising 4 to inevitably stop being Xbone exclusive so you could at least ruin next Christmas with it, then this might be the point to stop viewing. Frank West dies at the end. Yes, that lovable original Dead Rising protagonist so popular they had to do a version of Dead Rising 2 with him literally patched in to replace the other dude, who was even in Marvel vs. Capcom once, which was a little bit weird but nonetheless fun, this game features his canon death. Great, might as well have hit him with a bus in the end credits of the next Phoenix Wright. Still, as I said, he looks, talks and acts different in this game, so if it makes you feel any better you could pretend he's actually Frank's twatty cousin Marlon, who didn't get any of the lovable genes, but crikey does he know a lot about the Evil Dead films. It continues to be catch-ups month, that magical time of year when the extremely sick and bloated games industry pauses between massive heaves of pukes so that we can pick through some half-digested carrots and try to figure out what's wrong with the malingering bastard this time. To that end, let's take a look at a game that first appeared last March, but took the rest of the year to gradually squeeze itself out, like a life-threatening bout of constipation. Hitman the fifth or sixth game in the life of Mr. Hitman, Master Assassin. Cold in both the emotional and literal sense whenever he goes outside without a bobble hat. Not that you'd know this is the sixth, possibly seventh Hitman game from the title, which has gone along with the industry trend of antagonising all the world's filing systems. What, was every other Hitman game just pissing about up to now? Well, that might not be far from the intended message. The goal of Hitman 2016 seems to have been to create a modular platform for Hitman gameplay into which new levels can be inserted in my fly. Sorry, I meant on the fly. Get your hands off me. The game's six missions were sold episodically for ten bucks apiece, more or less a month apart. A rather clever way to disguise the fact that your full price game isn't very long. I use the same technique in my lovemaking. Between every thrust I bolt from the house and book a caravanning weekend in Castle Douglas. But I feel this is an ill-advised route for AAA games. First impressions count for a lot, and my first impression of Hitman back in March was an hour of gameplay followed by getting smashed in the face by a big stop sign telling me to come back in a month. With so many other games fighting for our eyeballs over the course of the year, interest in Hitman would inevitably suffer more diminishing returns than a financially stricken branch of blockbuster video. I only recently downloaded all the subsequent episodes to play in one big block because I'm a hardcore gamer with no social life and two legs Atrophy down to nubs like giant chicken nuggets, but after spending six episodes building up a mildly intriguing background conspiracy, the series explosively climaxes by waggling a hand and going, yeah, this will probably be important in season two, now go back to sleep. But on the plus side, this is the quintessential Hitman experience. You play a grumpy man who is commonly mistaken for a packet of bird's eye frozen cod fillets right down to the supermarket barcode, travelling to a number of glamorous locales represented by huge contained sandboxes sprawling with little nooks and crannies, tools and people with remarkably loose grips on their trousers. You're given a couple of assassination targets and away you go. Maybe you'll sneak off to a quiet little rooftop and wait for the perfect opportunity to install a top-of-the-line new ventilation system in the side of their fucking head. Maybe you'll engineer some terribly clever accident involving a chandelier, a recently mopped kitchen floor and a poorly supervised circus tiger. Or maybe you'll just punt a brick at your victim's skull and leg it for the exit while hooting like Daffy Duck. It's up to you. So far, so blood money, but what Hitman 2016 introduces is a much bigger emphasis on the opportunities it's set up for you. Every now and again you'll overhear two civvies saying something like, hey that bloke in the penthouse suite with a big target painted on his face sure loves to drink out of a water bottle with a skull and crossbones logo. Really? That would be jolly easy easy to swap with poison if one happened to be an assassin. Yes, it fucking would! Speak up a little, I can't hear you over our waiter being strangled by a giant packet of frozen cod fillets. And then a fucking breadcrumb trail appears on the map, guiding you first to a bottle of poison, then to a place where you can dress up in the uniform of a mysterious bottle salesman, then to the Target, and then to a convenient local restaurant for the celebratory dinner that strikes the right balance between representing the local culture without being too touristy. I'm really torn about this, because while this does make getting the fancy kills almost insultingly easy, on the other hand Hitman is the kind of game where I have to hit quick save the way the talent agent from the aristocrats joke hits the call security button on his phone, because every single mistake you make in Hitman inevitably sets off one of those cock-up cascades I've been talking about. It starts with you trying to knock out a guard without noticing he had a friend watching you in the reflection of his shiny bell end. then a bunch of guards come over so you knock all of them out, but then the civilian who was supposed to escort the ice cream man to the birthday party, or indeed any armed psychopath who happens to be dressed like one, gets freaked out by the nine unconscious guards in varying states of undress and you lose the opportunity, and the cock-ups just escalate and escalate until you give up and reload. Next time it goes great until someone unexpectedly walks in while you're pulling the unconscious ice cream man's trousers down and gets the wrong idea and you have to go along with it, meet the ice cream man's parents, get a civil partnership, go on a magical honeymoon to the Seychelles, and all the time the game's going, there goes the no kills bonus, and the no bodies found bonus, and the never spotted bonus, and the never accidentally got stuck in a loveless marriage bonus. So getting your hand held throughout the assassination opportunities does remove a lot of that frustration, even if succeeding doesn't feel an ounce as satisfying as when you had to figure all this out for yourself. But hey, you can still get that feeling if you ignore the signposted opportunities and make up your own. Sniping's a good one, find a nice quiet vantage spot, explode the target's shoulder grapefruit, and throw the rifle away before the bodyguards burst in to investigate the shot and go, damn, must have just missed him. There's nobody here but a huge, ugly, grimacing French chambermaid smelling faintly of cordite. Mind you, sandbox is a big word, and the maps in Hitman are slaves to the contextual button prompt. The difference between a ledge you can climb on and a perfectly vestigial dado rail is information exclusive to Mr. 47's lovingly shaved noggin, so you do get funneled down specific routes a lot. The game does give you more rewards for taking the opportunities it sets up. In fact, it gives you rewards for a lot of things. For killing the target with a headshot, with an accident, with drowning, for putting on all the suits, for putting on no suits, for putting on a just a right amount of 
of suits. There's also countless alternative targets for each map and more besides from the user design missions. Clearly the game was hoping to generate enough gameplay with each map to tide us over for a month. What a lovely dream, Square Enix. I dream one day of fitting an entire Toblerone in my mouth and everyone tells me that's not very realistic either. Pretty as your maps are, I get sick to death of playing them over and over again just to fill out a checklist. Without story context, and it wasn't even a good story, it's a dime store thriller with half the pages missing. All you're offering is scavenger hunts. And I got sick of those a long time ago when my uncle used to make me play Guess Where I Put the Fun Size Twigs. You may remember Gravity Rush being a quirky superhero sandbox type thing with Japanese characteristics, by which I mean the important characters are all squeaky teenage girls looking like they had to hurriedly dress themselves in an arts and crafts shop during a power outage, released last year on the PS4. In which case he remembered wrong, you idiot! Duh. As every intelligent person knows, it was first released in 2012 at the PlayStation Vita, and therefore was played by slightly fewer people than it takes to push a small car out of a ditch. But now the sequel's out and with no more obligation to prop up shitty handhelds, it's free to make the most of the PS4's superior technology. So they added some trackpad gimmicks. Oh Sony, the spirit of the renaissance lives on through thee. In Gravity Rush we play a young girl called Cat who owns a cat and has a friend called Raven who owns a raven. By the same principle I am sometimes known downtown as Mr Debilitating Hernia. Cat, or rather Cat's cat, has the mysterious ability to shift gravity around her which she uses to defend a strange society of floating islands populated by the cast of all the films of Jean-Pierre Genet. Including Alien Resurrection, thinking about it, since black monsters keep attacking. But Gravity Rush 2 starts with Cat cut off from her home city superpower and Cat and being forced to work for a poor mining community, although these doldrums last about 10 minutes before her cat shows up again, in a manner I found slightly hilarious. Oh, if only my cat were here, exclaims Cat in a moment of stress, whereupon her cat literally walks nonchalantly into shot from the lower right. Oh, there he is! I love it, it's like something from the beginner's guide to screenwriting for audiences with no attention span. Matched only by the rest of what I shall tentatively call the plot of Gravity Rush 2, which continues the trend started in Gravity Rush 1 of writing down a whole bunch of only vaguely connected story elements and then flapping its hands while blowing a raspberry. The real challenge isn't the gameplay, it's trying to guess if the current plot arc is going to be the final actual climactic one, or if it's going to fizzle out five minutes from now to start another. First, the plot is helping to save the poor mining community out of gratitude for being enslaved by them. Then we come to a big city with a class divide problem and overthrow the corrupt government. Then after we've done that, a giant monster shows up, which we immediately defeat. Then the game goes, ah, fuck it, let's just go back to the city from the first game and fight another unrelated corrupt government. And then you have to fight Sailor Moon or some bollocks. What's that? The budget's nearly run out. Oh, well, let's just pick a character at random and have them turn into a giant blob of faces and tits for want of a final boss fight. Then smash cut to credits the instant it dies. There, that's a game. 60 bucks, please. This really is story design off its ADD medication. Oh yeah, it's clearly you don't understand. Well then, make me understand, passing twat. It's called picaresque narrative. There's not supposed to be a single cohesive plotline running through it. It's a rascally protagonist undergoing various adventures to explore or satirise the world in which they live. Maybe, but they've been holding back some grand revelation about Cat's identity for two games now. You could at least explain why she keeps forgetting to wear trousers. The cat, not cat, that is, I mean the cat cat, must be quite the fucking trendsetter because it feels like every character gets a turn at mysteriously disappearing from the plot so they can reappear apropos of nothing the next time a Deus Ex Machina is needed. Villains become heroes, heroes become villains, it's like speed dating night at the Schizophrenia Award. And the thing is, I actually like Cat as a character. She's spunky and positive spirited with this lovable air of having no idea what the fuck she's doing. She still flies through the air like a limp noodle in a chicken soup machine, endearingly smashing into things. The gravity shifting controls haven't changed from the last game. I still don't understand why you have to stop and go into floaty mode before we can change fall direction. When you're in the sky with no nearby points of reference and trying to fight a fast moving flying enemy about the size of a wasp's bollock, it's actually quite easy to lose track of whether or not you're in floaty or flyy mode and press the shift button too many times. I can only imagine what the bystanders think of my performance. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it two crippled kestrels fighting over an epileptic bat? This is the major annoyance in the boss fights, but rest assured there are plenty of other annoyances sprinkled around to make a lovely smorgasbord of pain. Two features have been added that were also coincidentally added by Dead Rising 4. The first is a camera with the ability to take selfies. Why does it feel like every game I've played lately has included the ability to take selfies? I'm not saying that it automatically makes the game worse. I am however always unaccountably disappointed that the different poses you can get the protagonist to adopt do not include punch self in the sexual characteristics. The other thing is stealth gameplay, obviously, because when you have a girl dressed like a fitness instructor who got hurled through the window of a curtain shop, who spends most of her time flinging large objects and herself through the air and bouncing her head off lampposts and window boxes, my first thought is that such a person is entirely qualified for covert ops. It's the worst kind of stealth too, where they just switch it on for one mission every now and again where you fail instantly the moment a guard spots you. I mean I play anime superhero brick wall headbutting games to escape from shit like that. It's about as fun as adding a key to a keyring with one hand stuck up the arse of a dead chinchilla. Somewhat. Now about these trackpad gimmicks I mentioned. You lovingly finger the PS4 controller's electronic clitoris to switch to different gravity modes in case you feel like wrestling with a different set of dodgy controls for a while, but whenever I discovered a new gravity mode I felt more despair than interest because I knew it was time for another round of fucking tutorials. Tutorial mad this game, is like fucking teacher training college. Use your new power to kill some lads, now kill some more lads, now kill these ones in order, now kill these ones in a time limit, now kill them with a book on your head while humming the alphabet song. Alright, here's your certificate, you may now return to the plot. Gravity Rush was a game that had a certain idiosyncratic charm to it, which the sequel 
still has, but it was trying my patience. I think before they make another one, they need to sit down and figure out where the fuck Cat's character arc is actually going, besides into the side of a bridge support at near terminal velocity. Resident Evil 6 left the franchise in a bit of a state, didn't it? Imagine a nice fluffy omelette that you mixed together from perfectly acceptable ingredients and lovingly cooked in a pan for just long enough, but then you cooked it a bit longer, then a bit longer still, then subjected it to eight seconds of concentrated machine gun fire. That sort of state. Fortunately, Capcom has an emergency policy in place in a little box on the wall marked in case of Resident Evil becoming shit again break glass, and that policy states that if at first you don't succeed, give up and do something else. It worked for Resident Evil 4 when Capcom said to itself, hey we're shit at writing story and dialogue that always comes across as laughable and slightly camp, let's just play that up and make the combat not so much like trying to teach the elderly how to dance to staying alive. Resident Evil 7 again reworks the formula from the ground up, now it's first person, much tighter in scope, emphasising the horror part of survival horror, and Capcom have finally figured out how to write a half decent story. They got someone else to do it. It's also emphasising the resident part of Resident Evil because it takes place entirely in a spooky residence. Well three or four spooky residences, but it's set in rural America where there's fuck all to do in the winter except build yourself another house. Our protagonist, Ethan Winters, drives to a scary place in the middle of nowhere because his wife who's been gone for three years sends him a message asking him to, hey wait a minute, that's just Silent Hill 2. Fortunately RE7 swiftly differentiates itself because while James Sunderland gets drawn into a mousefully crafted atmosphere of dreadful symbolism, Ethan Winters gets a hand chainsawed off. Well that's much more expedient. He finds himself at the mercy of a family of psychotic superpowered Republicans who want to make Ethan's bodily integrity great again by sawing more bits off of it. Whoops, bit political that, better insult the other side to retain balance. In contrast to previous Resident Evil protagonists, Ethan is a normal dude with all the fighting skill of a Democratic Party election campaign. Although having said that, he bounces back from traumatic injuries remarkably quick. Stuff gets shoved through his hand so often he should start using the hole to store his biros and business cards. RE7 has taken a lot of cues from that popular breed of claustrophobic first person chasey chasey horror of the slender and outlast sort of area that for a while was using steam the way parasitic wasps use the bodies of caterpillars. The kind of thing that goes, no you can only run away and hide because we decided not being able to fight back is scarier and it's just coincidental that it's also massively easier to program. Resident Evil 7 looked at that and said, how about we do that, but also, weird idea, give the player a big fuck off gun. Would that still be scary? Yes actually, especially since guns bother these regenerating rednecks about as much as maintaining cultural diversity. Resident Evil 6's giant overblown monster battles feel even sillier now that I'm ten times more unnerved from being chased around a coffee table by an angry bloke with a spade and a stripy pyjama top. This does of course raise the question of why they bothered to give us a gun if redneck de jour can keep shrugging it off, but it turns out sometimes your attacks do have a permanent effect. It's a little bit inconsistent story-wise, but the game usually gives you a signal to indicate you're supposed to stop running and start attacking. The signal is that all the doors are locked and there's a big neon sign over the roof saying boss fight. So why do you bother letting us have weapons anywhere other than in boss fights, Resident Evil 7? Well, uh, there's still all those crates to smash. Alright, fine, we'll throw in some standard monsters for you to kill in between the redneck funtime hoedowns. Here comes some now! Woo, scary! I look at the monsters, and then at RE7, and then back at the monsters. Is this a fucking joke? They look like theme park mascots, they've got huge curvy smiles, they look like the dude in the original Japanese Godzilla costume went on a crash diet and fell in a septic tank. They slowly lurch around like they're balancing books on their heads and every time I hit them with anything they spend about half an hour recoiling from it like they're trying to get me sent off the pitch. There's always a palpable build up of tension every time the game goes a bit quiet for a while because I know it's getting ready to have farmer shovel fuck burst out of the medicine cabinet or whatever, but whenever they broke the tension by throwing more shit monsters at me I'd think, phew that's a relief. The game stops being scary when it loses the Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibe and becomes, well, becomes a Resident Evil game I suppose. It's not very long since it takes place almost entirely on the set of Little House on the Prairie and everything, and while it's at its most intense when you're trying to avoid patrolling hillbillies, looking back there's only like three occasions when that happens, and they never chase you beyond a minuscule patrol route restricted to about two stretches of hallway and an outside loo. Then they pack that in all together for the entire second half of the game and combat becomes mainly a single file parade of comedy turd monsters, and the game gets really over generous with supplies and ammunition, Christ knows why there need to be so many flame grenades around the farm, those groundhogs must be resilient little buggers. In the last hour or two the game acquires a bizarre obsession with trigger bombs. I don't know if the level designer was in unrequited love with the person who designed the trigger bomb model and trying to get their attention, but you could retile your roof with the fucking things. They make the final gauntlet of monsters even more trivial since they all lurch towards you slowly enough that you've got time to lay a trigger bomb in their path, back off to a safe distance and read another chapter of Of Mice and Men. I do recommend Resident Evil 7, I like the story and its reveals, the tighter focus, the fact that it's not Resident Evil 6, but then after Resident Evil 6 I'd have been pleasantly surprised by a dead prawn in a sock. It's no Resident Evil 4, because Resident Evil 4 was replayable, and most of RE 7's main strengths are lost on a second run when you know the mystery and where the jump scares happen, and then once you get past the skinny lady who shits wasps you might as well put your feet up, because there are very few really meaty challenges after that, and what passes for a final boss is about a half ounce of powdered redneck away from being a series of quick time events. But the first impression's worth it, it may even bring back memories of that wonderful first playthrough of RE4, especially as you skip down the opening forest path dreamily not thinking about chainsaws. So the stagnating franchise has been successfully rebooted once again, I look forward to seeing how they fuck it up this time. Going from established history it'll either be from bringing back previous Resident Evil characters no one cares about, or from being incredibly racist. Properly racist I mean, not just against rural white Americans. The supermarket own brand diet
by its cola of racism. It's official, the Yakuza series is now the long-running Yakuza series. There's quite a few of them now, and this month saw the release of its long-awaited zeroth installment, Yakuza Zero. A prequel in which we discover how Kazuma Kiryu went from being a sharp-dressed man with a brick for a face who likes disco stomping people, into a sharp-dressed man with a brick for a face who likes disco stomping people in a slightly different suit. We also learn how fan-favourite series regular Goro Majima went from being a sharp-dressed man with a brick for a face who likes disco stomping people, into a boggle-eyed weirdo who dresses like he woke up naked in a pet cemetery. And frankly, I'm a little disappointed, because I was hoping we'd have the opportunity to learn where Kazuma Kiryu got his ideas about what members of organised crime families do all day, because he doesn't seem to think it involves committing crimes. I mean, when Kiryu sees gangsters shaking down passers-by for cash, his first instinct is to polish his shoes with their nose cartilage. Kiryu, that's what you're supposed to be doing, you giant prat! I mean, what's the baseline Yakuza activity? Extorting money from local businesses, right? Well, Kiryu spends a lot of time in Yakuza Zero handing out large sums of money to local businesses. Fucking hell, man. On your first day, did they accidentally play the induction video in reverse? I am fond of the Yakuza games, but honestly I have trouble articulating why. Which is a shame, because that's me fucking job. Yeah, the combat makes me want to squirt with glee every time a very serious-faced man in an expensive suit violently suplexes another serious-faced man in an expensive suit into a mailbox, but you'd be hard-pressed to find a game model packed with more superfluous bullshit. In between the harrowing plot about deception, betrayal, murder and conspiracy, we are invited to potter about playing with fucking skill test machines and trying to eat every meal at every restaurant, which is classic 100% completion bullshit because there's no gameplay or extra content involved. Whatever you order, all you get is a two-second cutscene of our man hunched over his dinner with his back to camera so he could be dining on the contents of his nasal cavity for all we know. It's certainly unique, and I get a flutter of nostalgia every time I hit the familiar streets of Camarocho again, but by Christ are these games bang on. 90% of the bloody plot is cutscenes of intense understated conversation, and there's about 12 different varieties of it. Sometimes it's text only, sometimes it's voiced but you can still skip the lines, sometimes you can't skip the lines and all the characters talk with their mouths closed for some reason, and every now and again they do it in a fully animated cutscene so you can really appreciate the sheer nanoseconds of work that must have gone into animating Kazuma Kiryu's facial expressions. But at the end of the day, I always come away satisfied from a Yakuza game once I push through to the end, probably because they backload all the dramatic car chases and inevitable shirtless punch-ups in the second half, and it's the incredibly slow-paced build-up in the first half that tries my patience. Maybe it's the elite dangerous principle, the occasional disco-stomping spaceship battle is all the more enjoyable when they're spaced out by huge expanses of the black cavernous void of pachinko parlours and people making very serious faces at each other. Still, I'd be the first to admit that the games do get kinda samey, even beyond the fact that they all take place in the same four or five blocks of downtown Tokyo. They usually start with a murder, of which odds are good someone we like will get falsely accused. We proceed to pick apart the threads of a scheme to take over the Yakuza, so convoluted that the Riddler would suggest toning it down a bit, and there'll be a female character we have to protect because they've been victimised by the bad guys to a point that borders on fetishistic. In Yakuza Zero's case, Kiryu is accused of murdering someone he merely disco-stomped six or seven times, which he couldn't possibly have died from, because this is Yakuza, where everyone's faces are carved from antique wooden furniture, so he's forced to leave the Yakuza and become an estate agent. The kind of estate agent that dresses up in a disco suit and resolves tenancy disputes by stomping groups of four or five serious-faced men. Meanwhile, Majima is being punished for past fuck-ups by being given a glamorous high-end nightclub to manage. Fuck, better toe the line, Majima, mate. Next time they might punish you with a key to the executive toilet, until he's ordered to kill someone and ends up trying to protect them, since he's also a bit unclear on this whole organised crime thing. And so begins another contrived dance of twists, wrong turns and growly discussions broken up every five minutes by four or five angry, overconfident men getting decanted into the room from the inexhaustible supply for the sake of token combat. On which note, what's new is that both playable characters can switch between three different combat styles on the fly, one fast, one strong, one pansy ass in between the middle ground for all you ineffectual saps out there. But Yakuza combat has never been particularly sophisticated and I got through the whole game pretty much only using strong style combat just to prove I could. Majima's combat in particular was a cakewalk because his strong style gets a permanent fuck off baseball bat, and a nunchuck twirl combo that I used to spam my way through every boss fight because all the motherfuckers could do was stand there violently nodding their heads, like my baseball bat was confirming all their extreme political views. I only ever died in combat in the last few random fights when the motherfuckers have guns, which are really hard to dodge and make you roll around on the floor like a cat with a piece of duct tape on its back. The other new mechanics are weirdly financially focused, but then it is set in the 80s and I was surprised that at no point do we use the cell phones of the time as bludgeoning weapons. Kiryu has to run his real estate enterprise by buying up local businesses, another in a long list of 100% completion collectible side quests made slightly more obnoxious because there's no way of knowing which businesses you can buy until you run up and press your face against the window, and if there's one or two left you haven't bought, the game has no way to tell you where the fucking things are, so I have to run up and down the street leaving a greasy smear all along the frontage. Meanwhile, Majima has to run a cabaret club with one of those restaurant management casual games that your mum likes almost as much as living next door to the dockyard. Which isn't the kind of thing I want to do in a disco stomping crime thriller, but you know what, you could say that about the vast majority of the content of a Yakuza game, and they just wouldn't be the same without it. So my final word is, it's another Yakuza game, long-winded and weirdly hilarious in a way that only a scowling hardened gangster attempting a neon-coloured dancing minigame can be. Long periods of dull if weirdly comforting mundanity broken up by occasional reminders of why we're putting up with it, like a water slide connecting two floors of a DMV office. Neo is dark, stylish, a little too fast to keep up with at times, blandly attractive and was memorably portrayed by Keanu Reeves in the three Matrix films, but enough about that, let's talk about
about a video game. Neo, spelt like someone got startled just as they were explaining what gas constitutes the majority of Earth's atmosphere, is a new Dark Souls clone from Team Ninja. And sadly, we still haven't come up with anything better than Dark Souls clone for the genre name. I've heard people trying to get Soulsy going, but that sounds more like what you'd call soul music after it's been piped into an elevator. Neo is good news for all the weeaboos in the room who were furious that Dark Souls was set in Western inspired fantasy despite being a Japanese game and wanted to be slitting up samurai demons on a fucking pagoda all day. As I said, it's by Team Ninja and it's published by Koei Tecmo, so you should know what to expect. Lots of ninjas, lots of traditional Japanese architecture, and all the women show off more thigh than a Kentucky Fried Chicken advert, and all have tits like two tanukis fighting in a bin liner. Our main character is William, an Irish sailor with the mysterious ability to see demons and guardian spirits because he is Irish and therefore constantly drunk. After his own guardian spirit is stolen from him by a bloke who looks like Emperor Palpatine on spring break, William pursues him to Japan at the onset of the historical Edo period, accidentally becomes a samurai embroiled in the conflicts of the time, and goes down in history as the first ever weeaboo, which is roughly how the locals pronounce his name. A lot of the characters are based on real life figures. William Adams was a British sailor who ended up living in Japan and advising Tokugawa Ieyasu. The game takes two major liberties. William Adams wasn't Irish. This is the saboteur thing again, where we make the English person Irish because the Irish are the more marketable, non empirical bastard alternative. And secondly, as far as we know, William Adams never fought a giant electrified cat. Some knowledge of actual history might be useful because after we got to Japan, I swiftly lost track of what the fuck was going on. Some names will be thrown at me in a narration over still images. There'd be a cutscene of William looking confused in yet another house of some important Japanese bloke, and then we get dumped on a forest path to kill a round of gits. Which brings us to the combat. It's faster paced than Dark Souls combat, but not quite as rushed as Bloodborne combat, which was like dusting off a nervous cheater. It's at times quick and at times cautious, but generally kind of stylish, almost like it's a cross between Dark Souls and Ninja Gaiden, funnily enough. But if you thought Dark Souls combat was a bit complex with all that stat boosting, double handing, and Titanite business, Titanite being upgrade material and not something you say to compliment your wife's vagina this evening, then I've got bad news for you. Picking what weapon you want to swing about of the billions that your enemies disgorged like last night was free taco night at the weapon restaurant is just the start of your problems, medio. Do you need to be fighting in low, mid, or high stance? Is the living weapon meter full? Are we using the Kai pulse in the morning and evening and after every meal like a good boy? To what button combos did we assign the kick, the parry, the sheath strike, and the gentle finger up the bum hole? Does the toughness rating of our string vest matter as much as the defense multiplier? Do we need to be forging our weapon? Probably not, since the enemy will probably vomit up nine better ones in the next mission. But what about Ninjutsu? What about Onmyo? Wasn't he one of the Wombles? It's a little daunting, but if Dark Souls combat is like learning to ride a motorbike, then Neo is like piloting a huge yacht. There are probably lots of little things you could learn to do to smooth out the ride, but at the end of the day, all you really need is push stick to go forwards, which isn't that difficult as long as there are no solid objects between you and anywhere else in the universe. I got by sticking to sword and spear and mainly mid style, except when trying to get things down from high shelves. In the end, the combat's good in the same way Pornhub is good. It's highly varied and versatile, so there's bound to be something that appeals to your depraved tastes. But if you try to make use of all of it at once, you'll swiftly go blind. And speaking of inevitabilities, let's compare Neo to Dark Souls some more. The gameplay structure is the same. Each time you die, you come back to the last bonfire, I mean shrine, and the enemies respawn. You collect souls, I mean Enraku, to level up, and the one enemy that's a wheel can absolutely go fuck itself. But the rather glaring difference is that Neo is mission based rather than the Dark Souls style single cohesive world, and between missions you go to a map screen. So Neo is to Dark Souls what Castlevania Order of Ecclesia is to Castlevania Symphony of the Night, right down to a higher density of tasty thighs. Hence Neo goes for a much more fixed structure. The plot missions must be done in order. Each one ends in a boss fight and has a fixed number of hidden collectibles for you to find, consisting of green jelly babies and funny hats who bestow special bonuses. There's one that increases the rate that enemies drop healing potions, and the rest can all piss off. One increases the weapon drop rate for fuck's sake. Why the hell would I need that? I'm already using 90% of the weapons I find for arts and crafts projects. As for the boss fights, they're exactly the sort of thing I want in a salty game. I walk in the door the first time and I'm almost immediately smeared across the back wall like breakfast marmalade. Then I throw myself at it again and again, getting more and more cross because the hitboxes are as ever fucked, and a boss with a pointy spear can somehow use it to simultaneously stab an area the size of a shipping container. But just as I'm about to rage quit and start making whiny defensive posts on the internet, I figure out the patterns and finally succeed, getting that lovely self-satisfied high that is after all the reason I seek out hard games, and go to bed that night clutching my todger with renewed vigour. It wasn't the difficult boss fights that caused me to start losing patience with Neo, it was everything leading up to them. The story is too oblique to be involving and the level design's kinda shit. Dark Souls has you exploring the rafters of cathedrals and you can fall to your death through the exposed cleavage of a giant statue of Linda Carter, and meanwhile I was most of the way through Neo and thinking to myself, ooh, can't wait to see where the next mission said. Will it be a Japanese village, a forest, a cave, or a Japanese village in a forest with a cave? These are sarcastic thoughts. Look, I know that just because Neo's combat and gameplay invite comparison to Dark Souls doesn't mean it needs to do every single thing that Dark Souls does. If it wants to focus on the combat mechanics rather than resurrecting the corpse of Sir Christopher Wren to head up the map design, then fine. But I like exploring as well as fighting, and a bit of scenery can really enhance smacking things about. That's why I put pot plants in my grandma's bedroom. Things far too often got too corridory and samey mazy for my taste. I'm pretty sure the frozen village level in Neo could be faithfully recreated in the Wolfenstein 3D engine, or in a patch of mud by a toddler with a spoon. Ah, the time-honoured playground game of who would win in a fight between. So many youthful friendships abandoned 
Brandon to hair pulling dirt wrestles over whether or not the Enterprise D could take the Death Star in a straight fight, and then those same kids grow up nursing resentments, become video game developers, and create things like Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe, in which we learn that yes, Sub Zero could beat up Superman if they're in an incredibly contrived situation that makes things remotely fair, and if Superman is being controlled by your mum. Or they create those pseudoscience TV shows like Deadliest Warrior, in which we learn that yes, obviously a ninja would win against a pirate because a ninja is a trained assassin, and a pirate is a drunk sailor with an at best slightly intimidating beard. And it's the spirit of Deadliest Warrior that brings us Ubisoft's latest multiplayer focused Skinner box, Foreigner. So called because it's about how people of different races and creeds will never ever get along under any circumstances. Specifically, it concerns a permanent three way conflict between medieval knights, medieval vikings, and, uh, Japanese samurai. Which, from a geographical perspective, is kind of like King Leonidas and the 300 Spartans showing up to join in the Falklands conflict. Whatever, it's a fantasy. Three communities of knights, vikings, and samurai all live within five minutes' drive of each other, and they smack the shit out of their neighbours all day because it's easier than learning the Norwegian for stop kicking your ball over my fence. The story campaign reveals that this state of affairs was engineered by some weird messianic lady with a slightly Darwinian vision for a world composed only of great warriors, like Warhammer 40k but without the irony, inviting the same argument that you can't have a world that's only war because at the end of the day you'll still need someone to cook dinner and resharpen all the pointy sticks. The story campaign is about as much as one could expect from something hacked together by Ubisoft's D team to support a chunky melee combat engine masquerading as a complete multiplayer experience. You go through three chapters of six missions apiece in which the knights invade the vikings, the vikings invade the samurai, and then the samurai invade the knights. Everyone stays really cross at each other and nothing of value or meaningful impact happens. In each chapter you play as the current community's winner of the most generic dude contest, respectively Mr. Warden, Mr. Raider, and Orochi-san, and each mission is a handful of generic sword fights with bots connected by story moments that play like scenes from a Klingon soap opera directed by a narcoleptic mole. Why do we fight? Long pause, awkward stare. We fight because we are warriors! Characters shuffle around a bit like they didn't entirely memorise their cues. Valhalla! Characters standing either side of us eventually figure out they're supposed to be joining in. The campaign also provides the opportunity to find some hidden collectibles, because a Ubisoft game without meaningless collectathons would be like Catholic sex education without the guilt. So frankly they should have swapped out the single player experience for a packet of cream eggs I could eat while watching Sex in the City in my pants as I stew in loneliness. Fuck it though, if you want a single player sword and sterilization sim then you already know what I'd recommend. It starts with a D and rhymes with lark bowls. For cosmetics is a multiplayer game, bitch. I know, because before I did anything else I had to pick which of the three factions I belonged to. Seemed a bit forward to ask me to pick before I'd gotten to know any of them or how they played, but I needn't have worried. Which faction is the best? The shouty overdramatic cunts with the slow but strong one, the fast but weak one, inevitably the lady, and the in-betweeny one, or the other two groups of shouty overdramatic cunts with the etc etc. Oh, but there are subtle differences in what special moves the individual characters can pull off, like there's that one samurai with the pokey poison spear, whose special move is to go fuck themselves. But it still doesn't actually matter which faction you pledge allegiance to because you can play as any character you want. You can join the knights and be the pokey poison spear samurai and fuck yourself all night long if you want, which does rather raise the question of why we have to pick a faction at all. And it turns out it is for no reason, except to artificially segregate us as part of Ubisoft's masterful scheme to spread the seeds of conflict and disunity so that we stop getting together to complain about their sandbox games all being shit now. But let me talk about the actual combat, since that's what it all boils down to. You've got your standard light attack and heavy attack for mopping up the groundlings, but the moment you target someone serious it switches rather neatly into a one-on-one -on -one fighter. Use the right hand log stick to point your sword to the left, to the right, or overhead. You'll attack from that angle and block any attacks coming in from that angle. So you can wobble back and forth, eyeing each other, trying to decide when to strike or to feint until one of you gets bored and uses the kick button for a free hit. And if you're not sure what angle your enemy is at from, say, the look of the massive great sword they're holding, which you can't look away from because the camera's locked, then the interface helpfully displays big fucking arrows across the screen like you're playing Dance Dance Revolution. I hate when an interface fucks with the immersion like that unnecessarily, and while there is the option to turn it off, you know there are a lot of other players who haven't, and I'm worried if they had an advantage they might get the false impression that they're better than me and not jammy cheating scrubs. But all in all it's a nice 1v1 dueling engine. Just a shame nobody fucking plays the 1v1 dueling mode because they're all in the 4v4 utterly bog standard territory control mode. See, the essence of an honourable battlefield duel is lost when at any moment your opponent's mate might run in on your flank and shove a spear down your ear. So the 4v4 matches become less about dueling skill and more about who can run off and fetch their big brother first. The trouble with 4 you play achievements is that it's one interesting core gameplay mechanic surrounded in padding. Micromanaging equipment and cosmetics and passive buffs and ooh if you're very good maybe you could add 0.001% to your faction's chances of securing an imaginary territory before it arbitrarily resets next week. That's just drab number crunching in a drab setting, there's no personality to 4 boners. The character roster is 12 variants on a theme of armoured person who goes rawr a lot. There's no self-awareness of the let's face it inherently juvenile premise. And anyway, who would win in a fight is for two-way scenarios, and a three-way conflict is better resolved with shag marry kill. Personally, I'd shag the Vikings, because it wouldn't take so long to get started. He'd spend half the evening working on a night with a can opener and that's just to figure out what gender they are. I'm willing to bet it crossed Nintendo's mind more than once to call its new console the Switch. But thankfully cooler heads prevailed and for once we have a Nintendo console whose name actually means something. An appropriate meaning as well, for a Switch is another name for a beating stick with which one might conceivably flog a dead horse. Oh, and it also lets you switch between 
living room console and handheld, a service just as unasked for as it was when the Wii U tried it. But while the Wii U could switch from living room to handheld only if the handheld remained inside the living room, you can carry the Switch to the upper slopes of Kilimanjaro and still have a bit of a game, although you'd better hope there's some free power outlets up there. I guess Nintendo is still employing a fleet of obsolete construction robots as QA testers because the controls still favour geometric shapes over anything designed with human hands in mind, and using the thing in handheld mode with my massive masculine mitts was as comfortable as wanking off a VCR. But hey, that's the point of the whole Switch aspect. You play it the way that's comfortable for you and let all the other ways stick a U-bend on their todgers and piss up their own assholes. I feel Nintendo are vastly overestimating its average user's tendency to leave the house, but if you are forced to do so because of a family picnic or because most of the couch is on fire, you can snap the controllers off like a big electronic Kit Kat, prop the screen up on a flat surface and continue gaming as God intended, until the battery runs low, at which point we discover that some world-class intellect put the power input on the underside of the screen. So you can't plug the cable in while it's propped up on a table. You're either going to have to interact with nearby family members or rescue workers to pass the time, or carry around a large cordless drill. You've got two options once you detach the controllers, you can either continue waving the two ends around like a complete pillock with two garage door remotes, or you can give yourself a well-deserved slap, insert them into the special housing that turns them into a standard controller, and come and join us in the fucking real world. I say standard controller, but only if the definition of standard now includes having a wireless connection that's more like a casual pen-friend relationship. If there was anything between the controller and the console, such as part of my leg or an affectionate dog, then I'd get all kinds of sync issues. The game wouldn't realise I'd stopped pushing forwards and Link would walk straight off a tower to his death, which might as well transition us to the fact that there's a new Zelda game with towers in it. Because this one's trying to be more of a sandbox and I guess Ubisoft must have taken Nintendo aside and given some advice. Trust me, I can never have enough towers, my games are full of them. I love towers, my dog is named Tower. I grind up towers and snort them, sometimes at night I take a little model of a tower and shove it. Well anyway, Breath of the Wild is a new Zelda most closely comparable to Zelda Twilight Princess, in that it too is being released for both a new and an old console, and is most definitely a more advisable purchase for the old, because the old has other games, not to mention a degree of backwards compatibility and isn't going to charge you a subscription to play the same old Nintendo tat you've been repeatedly buying and rebuying for the last 40 fucking years. But I digress, Link shows up in Hyrule and finds himself tasked to rescue the usual princess by getting the usual sword and slitting up the usual bastard. And in other news, the sky continues to be blue and the Trump administration fucked something up. What is interesting is that Breath of the Wild takes a decisively hands-off approach to structure. The traditional Zelda linear acquisition of useful stocking fillers that gradually open up the map is nowhere to be seen. In fact, if you want, you can jog straight from the tutorial area to the final boss fight and take him on. You'll get fucking mulched, you'll need to be conveyed back to the save point between two slices of bread, but it's nice to see Nintendo finally acknowledge the many obsessive psychopaths in their core fanbase. Hey, bet you can't speedrun this game, you insane beautiful bastards, says Nintendo with a sly wink, knowing full well the speedrun will be online inside a day, and by week two they'll be posting blindfolded speedruns on Guitar Hero controllers using only their knobs. Everything else in the game is there to make the final fight easier, building up hearts and stamina, assembling weapons that don't break if you stare at them for too long, and the main point of doing the four dungeons is to enlist someone from each of the four major races of Hyrule to come and hold Ganon down while you get in a few free kicks to the ghoulies before the fight starts proper. I like it because it's organic game design. I like that you spot landmarks from towers by looking at them with your magic smartphone telescope and marking them off manually, because you know at that point in a Ubisoft game the map would just spooge a bunch of icons like a highly aroused clown with confetti up his dick. I like how the only proviso for getting the Master Sword is having enough hearts to tank the massive life-threatening hernia Link gets from trying to pull it out, because it's as good a measure of worth as any. And you know another Zelda game would make us solve puzzles stolen from the back of a cereal box for 30 minutes? Which is not to say Breath of the Wild isn't above making us prove our worth every alternate fucking step. The main source of hearts and stamina upgrades are the 500 quintillion micro dungeons that all have the exact same decor. Endless glowing cyan is like being stuck in Isaac Clarke's wardrobe during a rave. Making the final boss easier isn't really your only motive, we also explore for exploration's sake, and the game world's size and repetitive scenery makes it a bit dull to get around. Then again, I'm always talking of Wind Waker, Wind 70% featureless ocean and 30% conversations with fish, Waker. Then again again, Wind Waker had character. In Breath of the Wild, Ganon, or rather Calamity Ganon, which is his new title and not the name of a Nintendo-themed musical western, isn't a character at all, he's a generic evil force whose job is to sit around inside a giant pulsating bollock and wait to be killed. Character may be what we sacrifice with the hands-off approach, although the exception is Princess Zelda, I liked what they did with her, an insecure nerd in so far over her head that she's giving the blue balls to deep sea anglerfish. I've got some control problems, even beyond the controllers having more sinking issues than the fucking Titanic. The stealth element is a complete waste of space, and since weapons degrade like the atmosphere at a party after the cops show up, it'd be nice if the weapon selector didn't suck on old tea towels. But on the whole, Legend of Zelda Death of a Salesman is, while a bit emotionally cold, a broadly absorbing open world that offers something for every flavour of lunatic Nintendo fanboy. Old school nutters will like the traditionalist feel, 100% nutters will like taking photos of every monster, animal and air molecule, and as I said, the speedrun nutters will love it as soon as they figure out how to control it with a Fisher-Price piano and an egg whisk. First let me say it's a bit unfortunate that I'm doing Horizon <laughs> Zero Dawn right after Legend of Zelda Death on the Nile. To go from one epic open-ended wilderness where deserts and snowy mountains can be close enough together to be in the same school catchment area to another, that's just asking to come down with a bit of the old majestic landscape fatigue 
fatigue syndrome or MILFs. Yeah, it sounds nice to have a villa with big windows overlooking the French Pyrenees, but after a few weeks you start getting bored of it and increasingly paranoid of snipers. So I want to make it clear to Sony before we begin that it's not you, it's me. It's not your fault I've played so many sandbox games that I expect a section of map to become visible every time I get a stiffy. I'm just sick of traipsing through miles of lovingly rendered vegetation that I can't fast travel through because I need to forage stuff on the way and I don't want to show up to the next boss fight vastly understocked with healing herbs, crisp packets and dog shit. Also, I'm probably still the only person who cares about things like this, but the title of your game is complete rubbish. As much as it would fetch a pretty good score in Scrabble. Horizy Zozy Dozy is the game you're probably more familiar with as that thing with robot dinosaurs and the archer girl from that one Disney film. In a post-post-post-apocalyptic future, really weirdly ethnically diverse tribes of future humanity live a subsistence lifestyle in the overgrown ruins of their forebears and all knowledge of their history has become shrouded in myth. There are also robot dinosaurs for some reason. Although all of this does get eventually explained by the main plot, including the weirdly ethnically diverse thing. There was definitely a lot of thought put into the story of this one, which is gratifying. I do slightly get the sense that the explanation for robot dinosaurs was rather blatantly working backwards from let's have robot dinosaurs because they kick ass, but I'm not complaining. Our protagonist is the slightly misspelled Aloy, which I rank just below Jules from Recore in the On the Nose protagonist naming event. One wonders what these writers would call the strong female protagonist of a game set in a sewage treatment plant. Pissabeth? Ellen Shitley? Well anyway. Speaking of weird smells, Aloy is an outcast from her tribe due to the circumstances of her birth, and can only learn those circumstances by proving herself a hunter. But this is only the beginning as Aloy finds herself setting out into the wider world to unravel the mystery of her existence and discover the true story of what happened to the planet. See, what they're doing here is starting with a narrow focus on Aloy and her personal issues so that the scope can naturally broaden out over time to encompass the fate of the whole world in a manner that reflects how our personal scope of the game world gradually broadens as we explore it and uncover more of the map. A bit of ludonarrative synchronicity that will be appreciated by anyone who can determine what the fuck I'm on about. Putting aside the robot dinosaurs for now, difficult as that would be without industrial lifting equipment, I'll grant you, Horizontal Morning doesn't have very many original ideas in its head, but it admirably takes time out to justify the tropes it falls back on, like how it's subtly established that Aloy growing up as a shunned outcast is why she does the usual solo protagonist thing of constantly mumbling exposition to herself like the homeless nutter she technically is. I hope you haven't put that industrial lifting equipment away because we're bringing the robot dinosaurs back in, it being the unique selling point and all. It's the Far Cry 3 and 4 arrangement where animals roam the land to act as little walking loot dispensers and occasionally sneak up and headbutt your tits off while you're trying to do something else. Obviously the number of flimsy wooden arrows it takes to pull a chrome exoskeleton apart would jeopardise the rainforest all over again. So you have to use detective vision, I mean focus vision, I mean that thing where everything of importance glows like the warning lights in your head when the in-laws bring up politics at Thanksgiving dinner to determine the weak points and what weapons to use on them. So you can find a good position and make pinpoint strategic attacks, Monster Hunter style. And it is fun, once you've taken down a robot alligator or one of those things that look like giant roast chickens with their bums in the air with strategic hits to the sensitive regions, it's easy to get overly impressed with yourself and march with undeserved confidence into the range of those cunting flying motherfuckers and swiftly discover what it's like to be in a duck bond during a gale when you're a piece of bread. But hunting robots is just one aspect of the game and that brings me to another thing I'm sick of about these constant sandboxes and that's having 500 different gameplay mechanics and the usual ooh take the approach you want to take attitude that usually means none of the individual mechanics could carry a game by themselves and we're hoping that stringing together enough C pluses will somehow add up to an A. Let's start with the long range combat, the hit detection is for shit, unless some of these bandits have learned a mystical technique for making their heads non-corporeal for brief moments and the game has introduced every available long-range weapon by the time you hit the second village, so there's less evolution going on than in a rural school curriculum. Same applies to melee combat, you start and end the game with one slow and annoying attack that seems to arbitrarily miss half the time, and one really slow and annoying attack that definitely arbitrarily misses half the time. The climbing is restricted to rigidly determined climbing paths, and all other terrain can only be navigated by making furious two-footed jumps at it like you're throwing a tantrum over how perfectly climbable this ledge appears to be. And then there's the inevitable stealth. How that works is you're visible when standing and invisible when crouching in a specific kind of grass. I'm all for keeping the rules simple, after all most of Sony's audience is, but it does mean that we can be up to our neck in plant matter and the enemy still spots us because it's not the special designated stealth grass. I suppose it's because the stealth grass is red and Aloy is a ginge. She needs the one specific camouflage that matches her pubes. I should stress that none of this is a deal breaker, but it's also not helping me muster the same enthusiasm most of my peers seem to have for erection nice breakfast. The story aspect's alright, although it never answers the question of how someone who grew up shitting in creeks and sleeping in slit up robot horse carcasses every night can be so well adjusted and perhaps more to the point clean. And the robot hunting is a highlight, but it's all held back by the baggage that AAA open world games now seem to find impossible to shake off. But as I said, maybe it's just me. I'm about to play something other than a wilderness sandbox now, so if you're expecting me to do Ghost Recon Wildlands next week, then feel free to go suck the spiders out of Tom Clancy's dead grey cock. Near, so called, because it's very nearly spelled correctly, was a very neared, I mean weird action RPG thing where depending on your location the main character was either a shirtless middle-aged man or a skinny twink generally better disposed to shirts but couldn't quite figure out the whole sleeve aspect. I reviewed it way back in 2010 and 
and it left quite an impression. There aren't many games that dramatise the moment wherein Richie Rich transforms into Casper the Friendly Ghost, so I was gratified to see the property franchising with this new sequel, Near Automata, which the casual eye would indicate to be largely bugger all to do with the original, but after reviewing Near the first I have since learned that it too was a sequel to Drakengard, and I think I could be forgiven for not realising that. It might as well have declared itself a sequel to Mrs Doubtfire for all that it mattered. You might want to be careful being so laissez-faire with the definition of sequel, next thing you know everything will be declared a sequel to everything else, and they'll be selling Moby Dick in box sets with confessions of a window cleaner. Maybe we're all just sequels in this great disappointingly long-running franchise we call life, but the practical upshot is that you can play Near Automata without having played Near Shirtometer, although you might need a few extra nanoseconds to predict the eventual plot twists. The first Near pulled the old Planet of the Apes gambit where the fantasy world turns out to be the post-apocalyptic sci-fi future, and now Near Automata is set even further into the future when things have come back around to being sci-fi again. The main characters are human-like androids fighting a seemingly endless war to retake the ruined Earth from an army of primitive but highly numerous machines that all seem to be modelled on women's sanitary products. The androids are doing this on behalf of humanity, whom we never see, but we're assured they're all living on a secret colony on the moon that we can't go to and from which we only hear general announcements that all sound suspiciously pre-recorded. Doesn't quite take Alfred Hitchcock to see where that's going, does it? But ere you smite me with downvotes for the looseness of my spoiler-riddled tongue, the game's not actually about that. What it's about is the purpose of being, and what it is that separates a machine from a human anyway. The story begins when some of the machines start to display human-like behaviour and emotions, in contrast to the androids who are instructed to remain emotionless despite having been programmed with emotions possibly as a prank. Remember last week I was saying that naming the main character of your robot game Aloy was a bit on the nose? Well there must be something nose related going around at the moment because the main character of this game about existentialism is 2B. 2B as in or not 2B, you see, it's not just a kind of pencil. 2B is one of several mostly identical female android warriors, or gynoid warriors, thank you pedantry corner, who fight the machines with katanas and robot suits and dress up in French maid outfits. Thank Christ for that, I might have forgotten this was a Japanese game for two seconds and stopped loading my mouth with Pocky. 2B is assisted by a hacker named 9S. Hacker in the video game sense of basically also a warrior but with a 70% increase in minigame density. I don't think 9S has a hidden meaning, unless the 9 is supposed to be his approximate physical age, but Wikipedia does tell me that 9 is an exponential factorial and 9S certainly wants to exponentially factorise 2B, wink wink. The gameplay of Nier on Tomatoes is what we academically call an odd duck the kind of duck that spends half the day hanging out in the lion enclosure demanding to be called Simba. Remember how the first game, okay fine, previous game, took influence from bullet hell shooters by making every projectile attack waves of giant slow moving testicles like you were trapped in the nightmare of a professional zoo animal castrator? Well that's still there, but now you've got a gun, not dissimilar to a bullet hell shooter's gun, that you can use to supplement your traditional platinum games fast paced dodge focused melee combat against enemies with health bars longer than the emotional distance between you and eligible members of the opposite sex. There's also a hacking mini game in which the whole pretense is dropped and you play a bullet hell shooter for two seconds. It's like there was an argument over whether Nier should be an action RPG or a bullet hell shooter and the action RPG guy won, but the bullet hell shooter guy decided to bide his time and play the long game, so Nier 3 will finally be entirely bullet hell and the action RPG guy's corpse will be found in the parking lot with 900 million gunshot wounds. But the combat stopped mattering some ways in because there's an upgrade system not a million miles from the Paper Mario badge system where you can swap upgrade chips in and out of a limited number of slots, so I plugged in a bunch of self-healing abilities and never died again, breaking the combat like the heart of a little dog when they discover you weren't holding a treat after all. Then it was just a matter of getting to the end, which was a more complicated business than it sounds because Nier Arigato Mr. Roboto has funny ideas of what the word ending means. The first ending comes when you get to the end of 2B's story, at which point the game none too subtly suggests starting a new game, and we find ourselves playing the same story but as 9S, who was tagging along with 2B for most of it, so the differences are limited, but only after that and the second round of credits do we restart the game a third time and oh what do you know, this is where they're hiding the second half of the plot, where the important climactic stuff happens. I'm not sure what the point of all this was, maybe they were trying to make the most of the small and dreary open world full of repetitive combat and dull side quests, but that's like trying to make the most of a bowl of stale porridge by eating it with a pitchfork. The funny thing is, by the end of Near Far Wherever You Are, I was quite into it and thought I was going to recommend it, but now I've sat down to write it all up I'm like, wait a second, if the combat was kinda lame and the open world was shitty and the main characters were underdeveloped in their every sense of the word, then what the hell did I like? On reflection, Near My God To Thee was a lot less cleverer than it thought it was. Despite its lofty philosophical ambitions, the plot wasn't making any kind of actual point, it just dumped a load of existential thematic elements on the garage floor and buggered off to let us sweep them up. Oh look, the main characters look like they're wearing blindfolds but take them off during moments of revelation. There's some complex fucking symbolism for you. The second half had some pretty good gut punch story twists that managed to make some emotion spark off my flinty heart, but it could be because I've been stuck revisiting the same locations with these characters for so long that I'd gotten invested largely through Stockholm Syndrome. It is a very weird game, on every level of story and gameplay design, and that might be enough. Weirdness is refreshing. In the general blandness of life, weirdness alone is worth preserving. That's why we drew the line at nuking Japan more than twice. 
Well, as I said from the stretcher after I came runner-up in the all-county lard-eating contest, no one can say I didn't try. And that's not the only way in which Ghost Recon Wildlands paralleled an afternoon trying to hold down a stomach full of disgusting, highly processed fat. I knew it was yet another Ubisoft sandbox game and therefore another round of blandly visiting icons on maps like an overworked Uber driver, but I didn't expect it to be THE Ubisoft sandbox game, the ultimate archetype at long last. Come on, Yards, it'd be nice, every game deserves a fair chance, even the obvious dog shit. Ghost Recon Wildlands is a sandbox shooter reminiscent of oh blimey, that rabbit hole never ends. It might be quicker to the game's Ghost Recon Wildlands isn't reminiscent of. Well, it's not in the least bit like Jet Set Willy, because at no point do you have to travel down a toilet, except in, you know, the metaphorical sense. The first comparison that comes to mind is The Division, as both are flying the Tom Clancy flag, and between the two we now have quite an insight into Tom Clancy's view of the world, or rather the view of the world of whatever creative director is currently holding up Tom Clancy's disinterred head on a stick. The message is, have another cheeseburger complacent subjects, for the government has secretly inserted packs of trained killers into all the world's populations, and the moment our way of life is kinda sorta indirectly threatened, they're ready to step up and start shooting the disinterred franchised. Meanwhile, in the real world, the government can barely manage secretly inserting the president's knob into an intern, but I digress. A powerful drug cartel takes over a region of Bolivia, so the CIA do the usual CIA thing, send in covert specialists with maximum deniability, overthrow government, entrust power to America-friendly faction, then withdraw presence while crossing little fingers and praying to God that for once the infrastructure won't immediately collapse. Our main goal is to take down a dense checklist of leaders and underbosses by completing a fucking endless wall of repetitive missions which we can of course approach in whatever way we choose, providing we choose either stealth or a direct assault. Except the direct assault may cause high value targets to leg it, so the actual choice is stealth or extra stealth with bells on. Very quiet bells, obviously. So there's a big chunk of Far Cry 3 in here with the wild landscape scouting bases and marking targets. The drone you can use for such purposes evokes Watch Dogs 2. There's a heavy note of Just Cause in here with the whole CIA insurgency plot, and the process of liberating the regions by taking out the local leaders adds games like Mafia 3 and Crackdown to the hypothetical Soggy Biscuit game from which Wildlands was born. What Gostrakon Wildlands does not have is any of the things that made any of those games fun or interesting. It doesn't have Far Cry 3's Tigers, they're probably all sitting around around coked up in a wood somewhere. No interesting hacking gameplay, superpowers, plot, personality, or rockin' 60s soundtrack. It also doesn't have much in the way of tactical shooting, despite ostensibly being a Ghost Recon game. The extent of the squad tactics gameplay is this. You can mark up the three enemy targets, then press the magic button that makes your squad instantly kill them with no risk to you or themselves. That is not tactics. That is only tactics if using the fucking warp whistle in Mario 3 counts as tactics. And now I've said tactics so many times the word started to sound weird. Tactic. It's the breath mint from the mirror universe. What we do have is an open world with a splattering of enemy bases vomiting across it and little structure or order to do them in because letting the player choose their own direction was carved into the design document with a Stanley knife. I think the player's supposed to choose their own tone as well, since the protagonist, customizable Natch, delivers most of their dialogue in a faintly offended monotone, including when they occasionally go shit balls in mild frustration whenever hot lead is tearing bloody gobbets from their living flesh. Well, since the villains are the only people that seem to have personalities, I'm going to decide that we're playing a game about a government-constructed assassin robot on a quest to learn what it is to be human by murdering some. And you can't tell me I'm wrong because player choice. Another thing Ghost Recon Wildlands elaborately fails to have is challenge, because even putting aside the free squad kills, enemies can take bullets as well as my self-esteem can take mild insults, and the game reads as a headshot any bullet within the same postcode as the head, so I sniped my way through a string of easy victories with the starting assault rifle, which comes with a free suppressor, but you have to think really carefully about the pros and cons before you equip that, because it might reduce the weapon's effectiveness from an instant kill to a consequence-free instant kill. Furthermore, you're not supposed to be able to see dudes on the minimap until you spot them, but you can anyway because the game puts a big circle there to let you know you're supposed to be spotting, and so danger never ever comes as a surprise. So all in all, complete flatline. I hope you're satisfied, Ubisoft, because you've destroyed sandbox games. Homefront the revolution didn't manage that. Merely bad sandboxes at least throw the decent ones into sharp relief, but you did it by grinding them out month after month until they were nothing but tedious to-do lists with all the bumps sanded off. We were like school kids finding a dead dog behind the playing field. We were having a great time poking it with a stick and saying it was Lee Drummond's girlfriend, but you were the kid who took it too far and ruined everybody's fun. You picked up the dead dog and put it on your head and chased us around with it until the stomach burst and now everyone's stinks of rotten half-digested chappy. When I accidentally parachuted into a crevice I couldn't escape from because there's no fucking jump button, I was confronted by yet another opportunity for player choice. I could choose to fast travel somewhere and start the journey again, or I could quit and play Night in the Woods instead. Have you played Night in the Woods? It's this indie game about a cat girl who drops out of college and comes back to their hometown to find some things changed and some things the same, and there's an undercurrent of lurking intrigue. It reminded me of Gone Home somewhat because it eschews core gameplay in favour of storytelling. It takes a while to figure out what it's going for, and the supernatural horror stuff feels a bit at odds with the rest of the overall tone but I respect the game for drawing a line under itself design-wise and not getting bogged down shoving in standard gameplay bullshit until it ultimately forgets to add anything new and the bullshit is all there is. So in summary, Night in the Woods is a solid worth checking out if strong writing is enough to make you forgive the very slow pacing and gameplay taking a back seat. Wait, was I talking about something else? Ah, it can't have been important. So after Mass Effect 3 boiled down three games worth of complex politics and character building to an ending in which all we did was choose what flavour of ice cream got handed out to everyone in the universe, there were going to be obvious difficulties with the next sequel. How do we continue this story that could have gone one of three ways? How can a story 
story set in the universe where we picked pistachio ice cream, possibly also follow one from the universe where everyone got Neapolitan. Bioware Solution seems to have been to wash their hands of the business completely. Whatever you picked, everything just worked out, alright? The Milky Way galaxy's fine. Well done. All the races are getting along and they just bought a new puppy together. Peace and prosperity forever. Kind of boring, actually. You probably wouldn't be interested. Oh gosh, what's that over there? Looks like a whole new galaxy just packed to the gills with intrigue and peril. Why don't you go look at that one instead? Off you go, don't bother sending postcards, you mustn't dwell. Shoo, shoo. And that's how Mass Effect Andromeda starts. The Milky Way galaxy is going so great that four giant shiploads of people decide they'd rather live literally anywhere else and piss off to Andromeda. Maybe they're all lactose intolerant. So the overall theme of the game is new beginnings, which I figured out from how the main characters subtly mention it once every five fucking minutes, but hey, it wouldn't be a Bioware game if characters didn't spend most of their time verbally explaining their personalities while staring boggle-eyed at you like you just dropped your trousers. We're not Shepard anymore, now we're Ryder. You'll note that Shepard and Ryder are both kinds of people one might find on a farm with poor standards for basic spelling. But while the Shepard is the guard and protector, a Ryder is a pioneer who explores untamed lands to find fresh graze for the herd. And so in the spirit of exploration, our hero travels to strange new worlds, seeks out new civilizations, and offers to do their laundry. Let me ask you something. If an alien came down from space and walked among us as ambassador to beyond the furthest stars, would it ever occur to you to call him over and ask if he wouldn't mind popping down the shops to run you a couple of errands? Maybe that's partly why Bioware games always speed down the uncanny valley like a herd of autistic wildebeest. It's not just that all the characters look and act like department store dummies with snap-on plastic hairdos, the game feels like it was written by one as well. Ryder finds himself thrust into the role of head pioneer and the promotion requires him to have part of his brain cut out and an AI put in that talks to him inside his head, does all the difficult adding up and occasionally fucks around with his bodily functions. He takes this in his stride and reacts with bemusement when other people think that that's slightly fucked up. It does all rather come across as a plot written by someone who learned about human emotion from children's pop-up books. Anyway, it's not just the characters pursuing a new beginning here. Mass Effect Andromeda is what is termed in the modern vernacular a soft reboot. Technically a sequel, but refuses to move out of the original's apartment, occasionally steals its clothes and maybe plotting a deranged single white female-esque murder and replacement fantasy. It's the familiar Mass Effect setup, explore galaxy, build party, solve problems, occasionally come back to home base so that the space police chiefs can shake their tiny impotent fists at how much cooler you are than them. Like an aging barfly, Mass Effect Androgynous looks like a mess on the surface with its Jerry Anderson puppet show aesthetic and its hilarious bugs. I got a fun one where all of Ryder's animations were replaced by spastic jumping jacks like someone cut his Omni gel with MDMA. But you just get that barfly home after closing time and slip their pants off and then you'll discover just how much of a mess it is internally as well. Ingredients from all the previous games have been thrown in like Bioware are throwing a fucking high school reunion. The driving around on planets from Mass Effect 1 is back, except the planets are now sandbox maps with actual stuff to do rather than one square kilometre of sweet Fred Astaire. And planet scanning that Mass Effect 2 replaced the driving with is also back and badger buggeringly boring as ever. Going to every random planet, pointing to each one and getting a teaspoonful of crafting resources isn't exactly stimulating Mass Effect. Hmm. Would it help if we made the journey to each planet excruciatingly slow and dull and force you to watch it every single time you travel anywhere? No, I don't think that would help Mass Effect, but keep trying. I hear there's a lot of money in anesthesiology. On top of that, you can send strike teams to complete off-screen missions, create and manage new colonies for your people, research and develop new equipment, level up your own combat abilities, and then if there are any hours in the day left, you can bum around your ship trying to decide which of your crewmates you're eventually going to flip over and give a ruddy good seeing to behind the coolant pipes. But as much as this extensive feature list looks good on a pitch, none of it addresses the question of what exactly is Mass Effect Automata's core gameplay. Core gameplay is what all this ancillary fucking about is ultimately supposed to serve. In most games it's some kind of combat. In Far Cry 3, for example, all the tower climbing and vehicle challenges and crafting gorilla scrotums all somehow serve to help you fuck up enemy soldiers, as well as vengeful scrotumless gorillas with greater efficiency and variety. But Mass Effect Andrew Lloyd Webber's combat is bollocks. Combat in Bioware games is like managing a swimming trip for five-year-olds. You put all this effort into making sure everyone's properly equipped with floaties, and carefully work out a schedule based around the skill levels of each group, and then once you actually get to the pool, everyone just jumps in and pisses about for 20 minutes. But there are plenty of RPGs with shitty combat, because the core gameplay of an RPG can also be character building, making your character fit a role, a role that you are playing, as it were. But just about the only prior Mass Effect mechanic that has been slung in the bin is all that Paragon Renegade business, and now whether we respond to each dialogue with wit, with intelligence, with aggression, or like we've pounded ourselves between the eyes with a mixture of Botox and horse tranquilizer trick question, that's every response, doesn't seem to matter one chafed mosquito nipple. And besides, to what end are we building our character? See, after the last game was popularly considered to have a worse conclusion than the fucking 1930s, I felt duty-bound to power through the story end in the limited time I had available. The result was a rather tepid The Adventure Continues affair, but what's important is that having skipped a large degree of the side stuff, there were three entire planet sandboxes I hadn't so much as set foot in. So what the hell is all this tedious side bollocks for if I can do in the final boss perfectly comfortably without it? To see the grateful looks on the quest giver's faces? It's a Bioware game, they'd make the same face if I pissed on their shoes. Twenty years ago, before real life started to feel like a late night sitcom that got renewed past the point any of the writers gave a shit about it and is now seeing what it can get away with, there existed the mascot platformer, a staple of that weird transitionary period between 2D and 3D graphics when we hadn't quite internalised the fact that platforming is enhanced by 3D gameplay the same way bobbing for apples is enhanced when you've got a bear trap stuck on your head, and when most protagonists were big-headed cartoon mascots because the attempts at realistic characters looked like
like used toilet paper origami. A more innocent time, certainly a more colourful time, before graphics improved and every protagonist became a short brown haired white middle class dude, which would only serve as a mascot for the Kansas City dullards. But this era saw such wonderfully varied titles as Banjo Kazooie by Rare, Donkey Kong 64, also by Rare, Conker's Bad Fur Day by Industrial Light and Magic, just kidding, it was Rare again. You know what, let's forget about examples, this isn't fucking TV tropes. Let's focus on Banjo Kazooie, because this new game I've been playing, Ukulele, is to Banjo Kazooie what Mighty Number no. 9 was to Mega Man. Proof if proof be needed that there is no sector of nostalgia so obsolete, nor so loose in its interpretation of the spirit of copyright law, that you can't get a couple of thousand people on Kickstarter to pony up for a thinly veiled copy paste with the names changed. Banjo Kazooie was a 3D platform in which you gather collectibles around a pseudo open world to unlock more areas and skills, not to be confused with Conker's Bad Fur Day, which was a 3D platform in which you gather collectibles around a pseudo open world to unlock more areas and skills, and also there's tits in it. Ukulele is consequently that very thing as well, minus tits. Like Banjo Kazooie, you play as an animal sitting on top of another animal, or perhaps you're playing the animal the other animal is sitting on top of. Talk about an identity crisis, you're collecting golden prizes that have been spread throughout the land by a villain for some unimaginably contrived reason, and every single character talks by making one specific noise in a variety of different pitches, like they've got synthesizers lodged in their throats. And also like Banjo Kazooie, the game devotes about half a pinky finger's effort to holding up the fourth wall before giving up and repurposing it as a coffee table. I mean, yes, on the surface the baddies have stolen our magic book and we have to find all the missing pages, but the real reason for doing so is because it is a video game, and we aren't shy about mentioning it at every opportunity. I always find something obnoxious about this too cool for school kind of dealio. It's like walking into a Santa's grotto to find a slouched and disinterested Santa beard askew, who jerks a thumb towards a bag of toys on the floor before returning his attention to his copy of the Racing Post. Hey, more power to you for your irreverent subversion of my expectations, but you still charged me ten bucks for this shit. It's like farting in a lift and acting like everyone else is the weirdo for noticing. No, actually, it's like farting in your own face and sarcastically rolling your eyes at the smell. But hey, the list of backers in the end credits takes about half an hour to get past the errands, so clearly this is what the people want. In contrast to Banjo-Kazooie being a bear and a bird, Yuka and Laylee are a lizard and a bat. Nominally different, but functionally the same. One thing that flies, one thing that would annoy your sister if you left it in her bed. You've got your hub world and you unlock new themed worlds with a set number of jiggies, I mean pages, I mean mundane objects turned into exciting collectible by means of sticking E on the end of the name. Then if you pay the game even more staplerees, it'll unlock each world a second time, adding more content and collectibles with the high-minded entrepreneurial spirit of a heroin dealer. One might reasonably wonder why they don't just unlock all of the world in one go. I suppose it could be to pace things out a bit and give you a reason to come back to previous worlds to collect more crystal methies, but there's already a reason to do that. Some of them are out of reach until you've unlocked certain abilities. You can only get the Allen Wrenchy that's sitting on top of a giant erect cock, for example, once you acquire the Blue Balls attack that gets you into World 4. But then again, another of the things Ukulele doesn't give much of a shit about is sequence breaking. And if you don't have the Blue Balls attack, you can still do a prolapse pogo off a bit of brickwork that's not technically a platform, but they didn't put an invisible wall around it so go nuts, and get on top of the giant erect cock that way. I applaud that because it makes things a bit more organic, but later in the game once you unlock the ability to fly, we discover there weren't any invisible walls on the ground because they all got arranged into a ceiling instead. Sometimes if you see a tall thing, you should fly to the top of it to find the hidden distributor cap from a Ford Anglia E. At other times we were supposed to intuit that the tall thing was just window dressing and the invisible ceiling will smash you back down into the dirt where you belong. Getting the flying power is also the point that the bottom drops out of most of the challenge with an audible thunk, since half the activities are platforming related. But if I were to put my finger on the major defining problem with ukulele, the pulsating orange hernia that dangles most prominently from betwixt its legs as it were, it would be inconsistency. And incidentally it's a bad idea to put your finger on people's hernias. Yes, inconsistency. The rules seem to keep changing behind my back. You've got your bog standard spin attack for dispatching enemies, but as for whether it will actually work on an enemy can only be determined through the scientific method. No, you see, that guy wasn't vulnerable at that moment, he was moving 1.3 times faster than he does when he is vulnerable. Oh yeah, and your sonic blast can shatter ice blocks, except when it can't. And here's another power that lets you take on the qualities of things you touch with your tongue. What does that mean, ukulele? Because I've been licking this picture of David Hasselhoff for hours and I don't feel any more virile. No, no, it's just some things. Like you can lick a fire to become a fire lizard and walk through fire barriers. Ukulele, I just hurt myself on a flaming torch. I didn't mean any fire. Ugh. This is like figuring out what the in-laws want for dinner. Sadly, I came away from ukulele in a profoundly negative mood, but it was mainly because the final boss was an absolute pig. You can tell they put the effort in for it, because the two prior interludes where one would have expected mid-game bosses instead contained fucking trivia quizzes like we were having to take the fucking DMV knowledge test, but we finally get an actual boss fight and it just goes on and on with phase after phase, and which of your 50 different attacks will arbitrarily work for each new phase can only be determined through trial and error. It's a shame, really, that all the diverse fun up to then should be ruined by a boss that shows up and pisses on everything. Oh bugger, I was hoping to avoid gags about American politics. You know, Japan's a lovely country and all, but from what video games have taught me, I'm really glad I never went to high school there. I'm not sure I could have handled the overwhelming pressure to succeed academically, knowing that I might show up for final exams and find an enormous radioactive footprint where the school building used to be. And then there's dating, having to use a vacuum pump at a protractor to spike your hair every morning, not knowing if you're satisfying your girlfriend as much as the tentacled alien sex demon she hangs out with at weekends. Still, at least Japanese high schools always seem to have an impressive range of extracurricular activities available. There's the track team, the newspaper club, the guys who travel to a magic netherworld after school to battle symbolic demons born from the dark desires of humanity, and ooh, volleyball sounds fun. Which brings us to personal 
Persona 5. This is the first Persona game I've played, but I know the series by reputation. The game's a half high school life simulator and half fantasy JRPG, which really goes to show the kind of lengths Japanese culture will go to to bring tentacle demons and schoolgirls together. We are bog standard, mute yet paradoxically good at making friends JRPG protagonist, who is on probation for a crime he didn't commit, and is sent to a last chance school where he discovers he has the ability to enter a strange other world, formed from the minds and hearts of evil humans, and that he can then steal the source of those humans' malevolence and make them better people in the real world. Also, for some reason he has to do this while dressed like he has to go straight from a wedding reception to an SM party. He enlists an ever growing Scooby gang of fellow outcasts, partly to aid him in his campaign against a string of tormentors, partly to see what kind of stupid outfits he can persuade them to wear. It sounds complex, but it really isn't. Ooh, the school turns into a castle and the evil teacher is its king because that's how he thinks of himself. That's some sophisticated symbolism, and if you haven't quite understood yet, we'll explain it another 30 or 40 times before we're done. The morality is not terribly complex either. As much as the heroes wibble endlessly back and forth about the righteousness of their actions, the baddies all turn out to be so cartoonishly monstrous that doubts rocket away like a New York motorist after the light turns green. But hey, if I like complexity so much, maybe I should stop playing games with cartoon cats and girls in skin-tied vinyl who won't stop thrusting their bum out even when they're dying or bathing elderly relatives. Persona 5's story gets the basics down pat. We like the heroes and we hate the villains in the same uncomplicated way one likes McDonald's cheeseburgers and hates spiders that live in McDonald's cheeseburgers. But it does the job. I can even forgive the JRPG turn-based combat because all the systems are infused with this almost musical rhythm that makes it viscerally satisfying. Although having said that, if you're going to make a 60-hour RPG, have a speck of fucking mercy and have more than one music track for standard battles. Doesn't matter how good the track is, Bohemian Rhapsody is good, but if I had to listen to the first 30 seconds of it 40 times an hour for three days, I'd end up wanting to travel back in time and skull fuck the idea out of Freddie Mercury's living brain. But I digress. The turn-based combat is less about standing around exchanging attritive skull clocks, and more about figuring out elemental weaknesses so you can bully the monsters into giving up and take their lunch money. No, really, you can do that. You can also sit down and have a little heart-to-heart, which has a chance of convincing them to climb inside your Santa's sack with your other stolen goods and lend you their power. Later, you can combine two Persona together to create a third by executing them violently in a startlingly bleak metaphor for child-rearing. And when this was all introduced, I smelt a little rat and fancied I heard the sound of a dinner gong being struck to summon the 100% completion nutters. Because it turns into Persona Pokemon. And I ain't got no truck with all that tedious grinding up to maximise combat efficiency. Not while the review's due on Tuesday. So I just dial the difficulty down a notch every time the boss fights start again too hard, which probably explains why my career as a football coach ended so disastrously. But if I was the sort of player who gave a shit about fully optimising myself, Persona 5 seems like the kind of game that would give me a fully optimised nervous breakdown. And not just because you have to prowl the dungeons like the fucking child catcher striking names off your list, not just because there doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason behind what dialogue options convince the monsters to join you, you might as well push your cheeks towards your nose and communicate in wet farting noises. The secondary portion of the game, the high school life simulator bit, will also infuriate the psychotic completionist because you've got five stats to keep ticking over, and you've got all these friends and party members you need to spend time with to improve your persona and their combat skills, but the rub is that most of your limited number of days only have two time slots, daytime and evening, and you can only do one thing in each slot. Can't meet with more than one friend at a time, or just for an hour at lunch, no, because apparently we exclusively befriend insecure twerps who couldn't be any needier if they were in a permanent vegetative state. And the game's also a little unintuitive about what constitutes a time slot filling activity. You can get the metro to the pawn shop, flog a bunch of loot from the last dungeon, take another metro to the bookshop in the red light district to buy a copy of Razzle, and no time will pass at all. But sit down at your desk to craft one fucking lockpick and there goes the fucking afternoon. And then sometimes the game goes into a prolonged story phase and several days of cutscenes will go by with no opportunity to do anything else. So if you've got rented DVDs due back, then you can piss up a chimney, Joe Titwank. Also, when it says you have 20 days to complete a dungeon, you actually have 18, because you have to take two days out to prepare for the final boss, it being very exhausting to stand in a circle yelling PERSONA over and over again. But despite occasionally feeling like a game that was designed by sloths that takes forever to get anywhere, I admit to finding Persona 5 quite absorbing. Not for the combat, not if I'm knocking the difficulty level down the moment it starts to even slightly annoy like a jaded babysitter. I suppose Stardew Valley has shown me that I get easily absorbed by day-to-day life simulators because it lets me know what it's like to have a real job. But in truth, I kept playing because I wanted to see what happened next. There's a comparison to be made with Mass Effect here. Both games are about forming a Scooby gang, but I like the Persona 5 Scooby gang members because they're underdogs, they don't open up to you straight away, and they're expressive. They're not alleged sci-fi super soldiers with the combat skills of a dead salmon, they don't blurt their entire character and backstory at you because you asked them to pass the salt, and they don't emote like the same dead salmon experiencing PTSD flashbacks. Ah, spring is in the air, the daisies are in bloom, the mild April breeze is bringing the sweet smell of rotting flesh that emanates from the vacant lot full of disinterred corpses that the winter snows once mercifully preserved. Which is as good an explanation as any for why so many fucking remasters have come out this month. So if you're one of those idiot millennials who think Halo 1 counts as a retro game, then there's never been a better time to educate yourself in a couple of old classics and start the long, slow, difficult road to becoming a tolerable human being. Having said that, some of the old classics on display this month are playing a bit fast and loose with the definition of the word classic, and for that matter, old. Bayonetta's just been re-released on Steam, and I've got skid marks in my underpants that are older than Bayonetta. Although fair's fair, this wasn't so much a remaster as a port. Platinum Games finally bringing an old console exclusive to PC in accordance with the basic law of the universe that all matter must eventually gravitate towards a point of maximum sentiment.
sensibleness. A better example would be the Bulletstorm Full Clip Edition. That actually does posture itself as a remastering, and not merely a port to Steam, which is just as well since Vanilla Bulletstorm was already on Steam, or rather had been, before this thing showed up. But hey, it's only by getting the Full Clip Edition that you can have the original intended Bulletstorm experience, by which I mean pay full price for it. Besides that, you're getting a graphical improvement, but it was only one generation ago, so it's the kind of graphical improvement that's like hanging a slightly nicer chandelier over an orgy, and there's a new mode where you can play through the game as Duke Nukem. I'm guessing Duke Nukem was the only one to return their phone calls. Because I can't imagine the Bulletstorm devs sitting down and saying, right, who can we add to our game who embodies in our audience's minds success, high quality, and having a realistic understanding of one's value and capabilities? How about Duke Nukem? What an excellent suggestion, Crispin, let's go with that. Obviously I'm being sarcastic, and since it's so obvious I'm going to omit this sentence from the official transcript of this meeting. But anyway, let's move on to remasters of games that are actually both old and classics, such as Full Throttle Remastered, a scene-for-scene -scene remake of the classic Tim Schafer adventure, now with a pixel resolution that doesn't make all the characters look like they're having their identities protected. Because he'd already done that for Grim Fandango and Day of the Tentacles, so the only one left to do was the dodgy one. Tim Schafer has stated that Full Throttle's shorter length makes it a better fit for 2017 audiences, a surprisingly candid statement, effectively saying what a relief that everyone's standards are so much lower these days. No, that's not fair, Full Throttle is by no means a bad game. It's a fun, fluffy little yarn about the leader of a biker gang in a proto-Mad Max near future battling evil industrialists, the voice cast is basically a Batman the Animated Series reunion, and really, how can one not admire a point-and-click adventure game whose standard commands are not look, talk, or use, but look, talk, use, or kick in the bollocks? Unfortunately, the metaphorical monkey on Full Throttle's back, or perhaps I should say Monkey Island on its back, is that it has to be compared to the other classic LucasArts adventure games, among which it would be the runt of the litter, if it weren't for the dig, staggering around on its one functional leg, leaking on the carpet from every body part that can leak. I never had a problem with Full Throttle's length, it was more that most of the gameplay was shit, so complaining about the length would be like complaining about someone vomiting on your pie because they could only manage two heaves. Story traditionally steers the adventure game motorbike while gameplay sits behind to offer the occasional reach around, but for some reason Full Throttle is obsessed with breaking things up with arcade minigames, most annoyingly the bike combat that's like trying to play cookie clicker while riding a unicycle. But even disregarding those, the puzzle design just isn't up to the usual classic LucasArts standards. Where in Monkey Island you get puzzles that balance cleverness, good writing and world building like the insult sword fighting business, Full Throttle has a prolonged puzzle centred around staring at a crack in a wall. Perhaps there's an inherent issue with making an adventure game, traditionally a more thoughtful genre about characters who can't brute force their way through situations, about a dude who uses brute force like it's a brand new soda stream that he's trying to convince himself wasn't a waste of money. It makes me wonder why we suddenly have to craft some artful means of distracting the souvenir stand man when smashing people's faces into the dirt has been so reliably fruitful thus far. So let's move on to another new remaster, Planescape <laughs> Torment <laughs> Enhanced Edition, a CRPG popularly considered to be one of the best of its kind. Full disclosure, I can't confirm because I can only ever play Planescape Torment for about an hour before the combat gets too much for me. Not the combat combat, which is a load of sticky bollocks on a cold serving tray, I'm talking about the relentless battle I find myself in with the fucking text window, as it remorselessly disgorges endless spikes, subclauses, and paragraphs, and conversation trees with more branches than Wells fucking Fargo. I've heard Planescape Torment described as the best book you'll ever play, but sadly I'm not a book critic, because you need actual qualifications to be one of those. I like games, with narrative woven into gameplay, and only prefer books when I'm in specific sorts of moods, you know? Like when I'm on a long haul flight, or when both my thumbs have been pecked off by crows. But hey, I fully admit to having a low attention sp- oh, I'm bored of this sentence. Let's talk about something else. The last remastering I'd like to bring up this week is perhaps the definitive example of aging poorly, second only to a fruit bowl in direct sunlight. I give you Parappa the Rapper Remastered on PS4, which some people seem to remember fondly, but which looked to me like a string of cutscenes that couldn't be enlarged beyond native PS1 resolution, and as such you could miss entirely if a medium-sized fly lands on your TV screen, broken up by a total of six gameplay sections consisting of the crumbs of gameplay that fall off a modern game if you hold it upside down and shake it vigorously. I thought I'd like this, since I can hold my own at Guitar Hero, and the principle of press the button when we say so is one that the last ten years of AAA combat engines has been keeping me well practiced in, but the rhythm in this rhythm game is being monitored by a narcoleptic mountain goat. I could not for the life of me get past the fifth stage. I pressed the buttons when it said to, but the game wasn't having any of it. Then experimentally I tried playing as awfully as I thought I could get away with, and somehow that had a slightly better success rate. One of us clearly has something badly wrong with them, Parappa the Rapper, and I know it's not me because I got my test results back from the SDI clinic. What the fuck do you want? If you tell me to crack 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 the egg against the bowl one more time, I'm going to crack 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 your head against a plinth. In the popular subgenre of first-person horror games where you have all the defensive capability of a daddy long legs in the hand of a schoolboy with a difficult home life, of which indie developers produce a near constant stream because all they need is some corridors, a lighting engine, and a soundtrack made by repeatedly sitting on the arse end of a piano keyboard, the first Outlast was arguably the benchmark setter, a highly disturbing haunted mansion ride through a corrupted asylum that illustrated just how terrifying a thing the human penis can be when it's bathed in night vision green and bouncing festively back and forth as it comes at you in a poorly maintained public lavatory. It also had a plot that left a lot of unanswered questions, and now the sequel, Outlast 2, is adding another fairly significant one, namely what the fuck happened? On the surface the formula hasn't changed much, first person lost in crazy town lots of hiding from glowing green todgers, so why did Outlast 2 feel like such a third place trophy full of spit? Maybe we've changed, maybe Resident Evil 7 broke the spell on these hidey chasey horror games when it discovered that hey, turns out having 
having a gun does help. Wish I'd known that when I was in Slenderman's woods looking for me maths homework. But anyway, you are ace cameraman Blake something or other, who comes with his wife to hillbilly murderer country to cover a story, and makes the rookie error of showing up in a helicopter, which in video game intro sequences hold together like a jammy dodger in the back pocket of a pair of jogging bottoms. So the inevitable happens, and he's got to rescue his wife from both a Christian death cult and a pagan death cult that appear to be at odds but seem to find plenty of common ground when it comes to doing horrible, horrible things to Blake's gormless ass. Again, maybe Resident Evil 7 ruined this with all that chainsaw-based overzealous manicure business, because I swear Outlast 2 is trying to break the horrible, inescapable torture in first person record. Fucking hell, it's like the Passion of the Christ VR edition. You want to know the precise moment Outlast 2 lost me? It was five minutes in when I was spotted by the very first enemy before I could possibly have spotted them, whereupon they ran up and smashed me in the dick with a scythe. I then had to enjoy the spectacle of blood spurting from my brand new vagina before the quick load kicked in and I was back on my feet, Todger restored, barely 50 yards back. Instantly, all tension was broken. I'd seen things get as bad as they were ever going to get, especially after I got traumatically Todger tackled two more times before I realised I couldn't just sprint past the enemy but had to sort of lure them away and give them a bit of the runaround first. So everything that was supposed to scare me from that point on was just an annoyance, because the game had blown its load in the torture porn and I knew the autosaves had my back. Part of the annoyance was that, yeah, evading enemies is a perfectly adequate core mechanic, but there are two sides to that coin, Benedict Run Babach, running away and running to. And Outlast 2 never makes it clear where we're supposed to be running to. That's pretty obvious in a corridor, but most of Outlast 2 takes place outdoors in a wilderness where the difference between a plant we can push through and one with invisible walls around it can only be established by smashing headlong into it as a platoon of fundamentalists jab at our heels with pitchforks. There are one or two bits where you have to search a cornfield for the exit while being hunted by multiple rednecks, and it's about as much fun as playing Pac-Man blindfolded in a sports bar where the power got cut halfway through the Super Bowl. Mind you, it seems like all the other chase sequences take place in tight linear environments where gameplay descends into trial and error, and again, I'm not frightened, I'm annoyed. Every time I'm chased into another non-obvious dead end, it's annoying in the same way as losing another round of Connect 4 to a hyperactive 12-year-old with poor sportsmanship. So it's back to the loading screen to be alone with my nagging thoughts again, such as why the fuck is Blake still filming this? I know that's the sword of Damocles that hangs over the plot of every found footage horror film, but in Outlast 1 it made sense. We were trying to document something to bring the perpetrators to justice. I think rescuing our wife should be a slightly higher priority than getting this isolated murder cult onto Judge Judy, Blake mate, and one would think you'd want a hand free to defend yourself and to dig the nails out of your flesh. Yahtzee, clearly Blake needs the camera's night vision mode to see in all the places that aren't lit by strung up burning homosexuals. Alright, but why does he keep recording stuff, and why can we watch the stuff he records back to hear some of his internal thoughts on them? Like he's boring us to death with his holiday snaps. And this is the mass grave I had to claw out of, and there's me being violated, and there's me being violated from a slightly different angle, and there's me hallucinating my old elementary school, but obviously you can't see that because it was conjured from my fevered brain. Which brings me to one of the more baffling aspects of Outlast 2's story, that every now and again Blake finds himself in a hallucinatory vision of his old school, and each time it's hinted with varying degrees of subtlety that something traumatic happened there that went entirely beyond the cafeteria food. Now, I've played enough horror games to know that no story delves this much into the main character's seemingly unrelated backstory without there being a big juicy twist at the end, showing how it connects to the main plot. The problem is, and here we take the exit ramp onto Spoiler Avenue, so if you're going to play this game then cover your eyes and stick hissing cobras down your ears for the next few minutes, there is no connection! I played all the way to the end where we find out exactly what happened to Blake as a kid, and it's completely unrelated to the hillbilly murder cult he's having to deal with in the present day. So to coin a phrase, the fuck? Am I reading this right? Blake responds to the hideous trauma of his situation by daydreaming about a different trauma that happened in his past. Doesn't seem very likely. Personally, I'd daydream about something nice to take my mind off it, like a friendly dog with the voice of Bob Ross. Maybe I missed something. The childhood trauma involves a religious person being a bastard, so maybe that's the connection. Don't trust those religious people, Blake, even if they are just trying to make sauerkraut out of your joy department. I don't know. I didn't get Outlast 2. I didn't get what the school stuff was for, or why that lady gave birth at the end, or even what made the helicopter crash in the first place, except that it was a video game intro and that's the fucking law. I'm not even sure there was anything to get. Maybe it was just a slapped together series of horror and torture porn ideas, brainstormed by a group of oily 15 year olds whose parents let them drink too much soft drink and watch late night television. It's pretentious as well, with all the religious imagery and messing with our sense of reality, but at the end of the day, the only thing you need to outlast is your fucking gag reflex. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but this week's game isn't actually about a ghost warrior, as in a ghost who fights people by moving all their kitchen chairs around when their backs are turned. No, it's saying that a sniper, metaphorically speaking, is a ghost warrior. But if you ask me, yon subtitle doth protect test too much. Warrior carries certain connotations. You picture bold, powerful figures clashing on the field of battle, muscle quivering against muscle like an earthquake in a leather goods shop. But if a sniper was involved in that, there'd only be one bold, powerful figure standing by themselves looking confused on the field of battle before there's a distant cough of cordite and their head explodes. Not that I wish to denigrate the noble profession of lying on the ground idly splattering the heads off people five miles away who couldn't have seen you even before you turned to the vision centre of their brain into delightful confetti. After all, Sniper Ghost Warrior 3 has already done a perfectly good job of that. It's the video game equivalent 
of having to sleep in the bunk below a serial bedwetter. It's not just that it's pissing on you, it's that it's pissing on you in an entirely predictable manner. Sniper Ghost Murderer 3 is a sandbox tactical shooter in the Far Cry scout ahead, mark them up, stealth it up, fuck it up, shoot them up model. Except unlike Far Cry, it just saves time and gives you the silent sniper rifle from the word go to get all that troublesome gameplay challenge out of the way early. I say sandbox, it's actually three arbitrarily sectioned off mini sandboxes, which I guess was for the best, because every time it goes to a new map we have to stare at a loading screen for ten fucking minutes, so I dread to think how long it would have taken one giant combined map to load, maybe long enough to make us come to our senses and play something else. Oh, Ghost Warrior 3, tell me you're not loading up the entire sandbox map every time we transition to it. That's like an asshole housemate who runs the dishwasher when there's only three plates in it. But anyway, the game opens with a flashback to two brothers, the older, brash, confident and already enrolled in the military, the younger, more shy and troubled and looking to the older with hero worship. Now, if you think you've guessed which of these brothers will be our underdog protagonist, then you've been misled by your basic storytelling instincts, you big stupid cunt. No, the protagonist is the older brother. And after jumping gleefully over about 15 years of character development, we suddenly cut to the brothers on a mission to ghost warrior the bollocks off some fools, which ends with the younger brother being captured by some global supervillain group or other. We then jump forward again two years. What is this, the fucking Summer Olympics, when our hero, Mr. North, I've honestly forgotten his first name, it was either John or Rob, so let's just call him Oliver, is deployed to Georgia searching for his brother and finds himself up against a mysterious masked sniper conducting a reign of terror. Oh, Goshington ballbags, I wonder who that'll turn out to be. Who will be behind that mask when we confront this person who snipes almost as well as we do and seems to be interested in us personally? Will it be Whoopi Goldberg or Cardinal Richelieu, Charlie the Chip Shop Man? Ooh, maybe it'll be the competent story writer who disappeared right before the game began. Am I beating the sarcasm drum a bit too hard? Sorry, I'm trying to bring across what level of story writing we're dealing with here. If you could imagine a level somewhere between the ground and the average height of a dog turd, that's where we are. Hang on, Yahtzee. If the protagonist turned out to be a different brother than who you expected, that's a subversion of expectations. Isn't that a good thing? It might have been if the brother we got left with hadn't been an insufferable toss pot. I think his in-game character profile says it best. North is a firm believer in America's role as world police. Wait, what? So our protagonist watched that Team America film and didn't realise it was a satire? I feel like all the dialogue scenes North is involved with read like meeting transcripts from a support group for incredibly insecure people. Grr, I'm gonna kill all those motherfuckers and then leave Bible verses on their corpses in spunk from my incredibly huge cock. Grr, yes, do that thing you just described. I will make a note of it along the side of my even larger cock. Wait, my cock just got slightly bigger! When North isn't using his sniper rifle to make people's jawbones spin around like football rattles, he largely spends his time finding persons of interest and getting information from them. He has a three-step process for doing so. First he asks them a question, then he asks it again but with a period between each word, then he usually just threatens to smash their teeth in. And I noticed one of the optional objectives was do not provoke anyone, so I wanted on record that I didn't tell him to say that game. North is assisted by a small team of support characters, most of whom are hot women. That's why he's sometimes known as Magnetic North. One of them sporting enough cleavage to conceal an entire manila folder, and the other's got an arse like mating narwhals and wears vacuum sealed plastic bin liners instead of trousers. They also act really catty to each other because both of their compass roses are pointing north, if you catch my drift. It's like a fucking James Bond film, but James Bond has had all his charisma sucked out and replaced with unresolved parental issues. It's all so mind numbingly lacking in nuance. Seems like every single person we shoot is a bald bearded Russian with angry domestic violence eyes, and when we are given information on targets, they always seem to be dastardly criminals on top of whatever reason we have for shooting them. Blimey, he's a high ranking mercenary, a drug dealer, and a serial rapist. He must have very good time management skills. I can barely work on two projects in the week. After all that, the core gameplay is just sort of dull, really. You have the what now seems to be mandatory drone to scout the area, and you have to stare at enemies for ages before North will wake the fuck up and mark them. And sometimes you won't even mark them, because it turns out they're unarmed workers who just happen to also be in an enemy stronghold, but won't attack you or raise a stink, because I guess the enemy soldiers are dicks about paying overtime. Effort has been made to create sniping gameplay with a degree of skill and complexity. There are always plenty of possible vantage spots. You can extend the little bipod legs and steady your rifle on the floor or on a chest high wall, and you have to factor in bullet drop off and wind as you change the angle of your scope in accordance with the target distance. Or you press the magic hold breath button, which steadies your gun even if you're holding it in midair with one hand on your balls, and makes a big glowing dot appear showing exactly where the bullet will hit, so so much for that. I'm sure some admirable bastion of humanity will inform me there's an option to switch that off, but then I'd have to play Sniper Ghost Warrior 3 some more, and I'd rather hammer my scrotum into a six foot pancake and roll myself into a bollock burrito. I wonder how far they're willing to push this. I'm already having to call the sequel police every time they reboot an old game and not change the title, and now look. The first game to be named Prey isn't particularly old, and more to the point is somewhere on the low end of bugger all to do with this new game called Prey. Watch it, Bethesda, this is the kind of bullshit that brings down the sequel feds. Alright, both games are about alien invasions, but by that logic it might as well have been called Space Invaders Episode 973. This really goes to show how utterly allergic these bean-counting, creatively bankrupt loaves of chunky shite are to new ideas. They had a perfectly acceptable original IP and still felt the need to slap on whatever pre-existing name they could find clinging to the side of the rubbish chute. Prey 2017's more of a spiritual successor to System Shock 2 than Prey 2006, not 
to be confused with the official spiritual successor System Shock 2, Bioshock, or Doom 3, or Dead Space, or basically every sci-fi horror game since 1999, blimey, how many spiritual successors does one game need? There'll be bloodshed at the reading of the will, I tell you that. Prey 2017, god that's awkward to say, but Prey 17 sounds too much like a teen gossip mag, gains a few spiritual successor points by having basically the same plot as System Shock 2 as well. There's a spaceship, the crew encountered something alien, some kinky weirdo got it into their head to put the alien thing inside themselves, and now you've woken up on the ship with no memory, and have to piece together what happened and firmly discipline the newly monsterized crew by bonking them with a wrench. There's also plenty of influence from Bioshock on display, and that the whole place has a retro aesthetic about it, like you're trapped inside an episode of Tomorrow's World from the 70s. You upgrade your character and skills by taking a foreign device and doing something harrowing to your soft fleshy parts. And there's a bit of a moral choice thing going on, but don't panic, it's the sneaky kind of moral choice mechanic that creeps in so gradually you barely notice, like a beetle in a packet of licorice all sorts. But whether you're good or bad, you're always the kind of person who searches every cabinet in the kitchen and then eats 18 bananas in 5 seconds, like a video of your mum on Fast Forward. Another game I'm reminded of is The Evil Within, because Prey also opens with a somewhat interesting set piece that's largely fuck all to do with the rest of the game, but bollocks to it, maybe the hype videos will sell a few more copies. Get past that and the game proper begins. Your character is you. Morgan you, that is. Scientist, executive, let's face it, probably responsible for this whole mess type person, and roughly the first direction you're given is a little note from your previous self instructing you to feed the cat and pick up some cornflakes, and if there's any time left, maybe think about blowing up the entire station to save Earth from the alien menace. Hey, fuck you, myself, you don't know me. Maybe while I'm going through the extraordinarily prolonged process of unlocking the self-destruct, I'll explore the vessel, meet survivors, and learn more about the backstory so at the end of all this I can make an informed choice on whether I want to blow everything to space hell or find a less drastic solution, like hold the alien menace down and make it watch Independence Day on loop for three days. So since Breath of the Wild is so popular with the kids these days, open-endedness is back in fashion and Prey is strutting up and down that catwalk with an enthusiastic goose step. When the introduction's over, the game informs us we have the run of the entire ship except for all the locked parts. But what's neat is that you can leave an airlock, explore the entire ship's exterior, and re-enter it by any airlock you want. Oh hang on, they're all locked as well. Alright, it's not that open-ended. And besides, I didn't see much point in exploring beyond where I had to go for the main missions because monsters continually respawn, a chest of drawers can only be looted once, and I wasn't convinced that I'd find more resources than I'd use up going walkabouts. Ammunition is always scarce, even though you can load armfuls of kitchen appliances and medical equipment into the recycler and turn them into more ammo, as part of a rather on-the-nose metaphor for recent changes in American foreign policy. Because at least early on I was going through pistol ammo like a boarding school dormitory goes through tissues the night after free Wi-Fi is installed. Combat took me a while to get a handle on, the way one gets a handle on a horse when the vet with the big testicle clippers closes in. Like Bioshock combat, it gets very chaotic very fast. It loves taking you by surprise. The starting enemy is a mimic that can disguise itself as small objects, so you're merrily searching a desk for old dictaphones and breast milk pumps when a mug jumps up and sticks its tongue down your throat. Then it runs out of your field of view and starts nibbling your bum while you blindly spin around looking for it, smashing your wrench about and you feel like a gorilla in a phone booth with a wasp. The next enemy zips about like a nervous party host and has a really hard to avoid projectile attack that chomps up your health bar like a fun size Snickers. On that note, Prey just can't get enough of murdering me without warning. I'm sure it never stops being funny for it. Oops, the enemy created a big bomb right next to you where you didn't look and it didn't have line of sight, why didn't you dodge it, you loser? Oh, you thought you could increase your spacesuit thrust speed and lightly brush against a wall? Dead. That's what we do to hurrying heralds. Oh, what's this now? You're trying to walk across an empty room? I think someone forgot to stay at least ten feet away from broken electrical panels. Zap! Blimey, was that built by the same contractor that made the consoles on the Starship Enterprise? But the combat at least I eventually figured out. All you have to do is stick fistfuls of alien drugs in your face until you can psychic beam all the motherfuckers to death, remember where all the robots are that restore your side points for free, and quick save like a twitchy drinking bird toy. And Prey is in all aspects a game that you have to figure out, which I suppose it's to its credit. It would be no bad thing to my mind if the trend for vaguely retro-style open-ended game world structuring continued. It's all tasty millet seed for the exploration parakeet. Once it gets going, Prey is an effective enough self-contained action RPG. What it isn't is an effective horror game. Part of it's the way most of the ships lit up like a fucking Ikea showroom, but I think a lot of it's the old Arcane Studios character problem again. I'm not saying there's been no improvement, it's not as bad as Dishonored, the all done wall most monotone voice competition, but what survivors are on Talos 1 don't act much like their former friends and crewmates are having their nostrils split by space horrors two rooms over. They come across like they're just having a bad day at work. Ugh, Mr. Henderson was in a foul mood this morning. I only stopped in to drop off the figures and he tried to dissolve my arms and legs off with his acid spitting more. People often say to me, Yatsu, your support of VR as a concept seems rather incongruous with your established tendency to neophobically reject gimmicky hardware. It seems odd that someone usually so mindful of the slightest flaws in games can forgive a gaming system whose fancy plastic eye trough could be repurposed as a sick bucket at any moment, also Veni Vidi Vici. And I say, well, the ghost of Julius Caesar, have you ever thought that maybe we're the ones who aren't meeting VR halfway? We're going to have to suck up this whole vomiting nonsense if we want to be serious about immersion tech. When the hyper-intelligent alien whales declare war on our society and we have to assault their undersea cities in giant torpedo-equipped mecha squid, the remote control operators in their sensory deprivation pods aren't going to be able to turn over and complain that their tummy hurts. So I've been fiddling with the Oculus Rift lately and have been playing a new game that the Oculus people seem to be really trying to push. Wilson's Heart. Not to be confused with Wilson's Heart, 
bath, which is the fireplace, especially for former presidents named Woodrow. That wasn't exactly A material, was it? Fuck it, move on. This was also my first time using the motion controls, or to use the proper name, the fucking motion controls. I'll admit the touch devices are an improvement on waving dildos around, because the Oculus constantly tracks your hand and finger positions, rather than trying to interpret the spastic flails as they come. But at the end of the day, whatever buttons you're pushing or titties you're fondling in VR Magic Land, you're still groping empty air and getting constant reminders of the real world, where you're just a twat on a couch with bills to pay and two pounds of plastic strapped to your eyeballs. But immersion aside, so you're looking down and seeing your hands inside the VR world reacting and moving in perfect synchronicity with your meat space ones, what then? You're still rooted to the spot and can't even rotate without the risk of making a confession to the Church of Armitage Shanks, so the potential for deep gameplay is limited. It's more suited to the sort of thing that's euphemistically billed as an experience rather than a game, where there's a fruit bowl and you pick up a banana and then you look at the banana and then I guess that's where you're supposed to reach orgasm. Wilson's Heart is an attempt to get a full-on narrative adventure game out of that setup. It's a horror game where you wake up in an abandoned hospital with no memory of how you got there. What bold new strides we're taking with this new technology. Next you'll be telling me it's dark and raining outside and the electrics are on the futz. Oh wow, I didn't even mention the lightning storm. I think that fills out my bingo card. To its credit though, the game's not asking to be taken seriously, which is just as well. It's all in black and white and it's deliberately evoking old horror B-movies in a universal monster sort of area. Think vampires, werewolves, the creature from the African-American lagoon. The main character is Wilson, cantankerous old fart and former neighbour to Dennis the Menace, who acquires a whole new suite of problems when he discovers his heart has been removed and replaced with a weird mechanical device that looks like the puzzle box from Hellraiser had sex with a magic eight ball. This device has many strange gameplay convenient powers, such as the ability to fix malfunctioning light fittings. What do you mean, call an electrician? How is that easier than selling my body and soul to channel the forces of a capricious ethereal nether world? Alright, how do we play this game then? Well first, you need to stand up in the middle of your living room. Let me stop you there, game, with a hearty bollocks to you. I went through this already with Rise of Nightmares, I'll only stand around getting my feet sore for hours if I'm at a rock concert, or a cattle auction, or anywhere else where there's a non-zero chance of getting laid. I'm going to sit on my nice comfy couch, tell the game that I'm standing, and we can just roleplay that I'm sitting in a very high wheelchair, okay? Okay, but don't come crying to me next time we need you to open a drawer on a low desk and you crack your knuckles on your coffee table. So there we are sitting three feet off the ground in an abandoned hospital, and the true horror grips us as we look around the room and see a number of ghosts peering interestedly at doors and furniture, until we realise, oh wait, that's the user interface. This is how we're bypassing the motion sickness problem. Instead of free movement, we jump from position to position like the original Mist. But hey, there are people who still think of Mist as a classic, generally people who haven't played it lately. And I don't feel nauseous. I'm just getting a headache like I'm stuck in a metal lift with a concert brass section. I think that's because I'm constantly having to twist my neck around and look for travel points behind me. Guess you should have stood up after all, Yards. Oh sure, if I were standing I could have turned all the way around and then throttled myself with the Oculus cord. So the puzzle is a pretty standard time-wasting fare for a modern adventure game. There's an obstacle, there's at best three rooms to explore, and the solution for each obstacle is obvious as soon as you've explored everything. There's a Randy Stallion in one room and a pair of sturdy wanking gloves in the other, that sort of thing. I guess it's the experience thing again that's less for the intellectual challenge. We're supposed to still be creaming ourselves over the fact that we're actually using our own hands to jerk off a horse. There's also the occasional combat section, the mechanics for which change from battle to battle, but they generally start with you getting insta-killed three or four times before you figure out what particular gang sign you need to throw up to deflect the attacks. I suppose there's some catharsis in repeatedly punching the air as the air squeaks and makes fleshy noises, but things fall down a bit whenever you're called upon to accurately throw something. Throwing accurately with motion controls is more art than science. I watch my missile bounce off the ground three feet away and I'm right back at middle school, rounders practice. Terrifying, yes, but not in the right way. Wilson's heart, in summary, is harmless enough with decent production value, but will seem adorably quaint when stroke if, and that's a massive pulsating if, VR moves out of the experimental phase, like watching a 3D movie from the 80s without the 3D on, so you're left wondering why the actors keep pointing things at the camera and acting like you're meant to be shitting yourself. With that in mind, making the rest of the game as quaint as possible was smart, although not as smart as it thinks it is. Spoiler warning, you know the drill, buckets on heads. Throughout the game we find bodies drained of blood and conclude there's a vampire about. Now, one of the NPCs is tall, thin, with a widow's peak and pointy ears, and is named Bella, as in Lugosi. No, seriously. Of course, he's not the vampire, but what bothers me is how, after that's revealed, the game seems so fucking pleased with itself. Bet you thought he was the vampire, you silly sausage. Ha ha, crow crow. Actually, I didn't, Wilson's heart, because I was giving you one nano angstrom of credit. And now to solve the mystery of Mr. W. Airwolf and his fondness for tennis balls. When Deck 13 Interactive set out to make a game to rival Dark Souls, the naysayers said it couldn't be done, but Deck 13 damn well knuckled down and made Lords of the Fallen, thus proving the naysayers right. Because Lords of the Fallen was, while superficially Dark Souls-esque, short, boring and reminiscent of a D&D campaign run by a bloke who collects knives. But nonetheless emboldened, having gotten the straight rip-off out of the way with a dark fantasy game, Deck 13 now moves to bring super hard exploration RPGs to the world of science fiction with their new game, The Surge, thus breathing new life into the word Surge, which was previously of use only to electricians and erotic fiction writers. Seriously, try it. Describe any human body part as surging and voila, you're writing erotic fiction. Tenderly he caressed her surging kneecaps. Sadly, there's very little erotic about The Surge, which continues many of the trends started by Lords of the Fallen in that the combat's a bit clunky and most of the characters look like they covered themselves in glue and rolled around in a dumpster.
dumpster full of old dishwasher parts. I don't know if the surge is as short as Lords of the Fallen, I've heard it is, but I couldn't say because I stopped playing at the third boss. In fact, let's not mince words, I think I might hate the surge. I feel like I've been easier going lately, it's probably because I have a small dog now, but I forgot how much I enjoy really hating things. It's like putting on a favourite old sweater and smacking yourself in the balls with your childhood teddy. And the surge got off to such a promising start, too. We open on a futuristic train with our slightly generic main character Warren, so called because he likes sticking rabbits up his bum, making his way to his first day at work with some kind of tech company. And when we're given control, we move him away from his seat and see for the first time that he's wheelchair bound. That's actually pretty neat, storytelling wise. Just a smidgen ripped off from James Cameron's avatar, but hey, without cutscenes or dialogue, we've established our protagonist as vulnerable and hoping for the better life that this tech company's industrial robot suits can offer. So we probably felt a bit gypped when it turned out all they were going to do was nail bits of scrap metal to his legs. You see, what follows the prologue is a cinematic in which Warren gets all his fancy new cyber bits drilled into his flesh, except they forgot the anaesthetic and he's awake and screaming the whole way through as the camera zooms gratuitously in on the blood squirting out of his new shoulder-mounted shelf brackets. It's quite harrowing, and I'm not even sure what the point of it is. I'm sorry, The Surge, perhaps there's been a misunderstanding. I came here for some exciting sci-fi action, but you seem to be showing me crippled torture porn. All right, fine, begrudge is a little fun. Bam, now you're in a junkyard fighting robots, go. It's that abrupt. Maybe if Warren had interacted with another human being during the wheelchair prologue segment, we could have gotten a handle on some context. As it stands, for all we know, the torture porn cinematic and everything following could just be some kind of how not to do it occupational health and safety video they're making Warren watch. But this is another callback to Lords of the Fallen, isn't it? Which also began with a pre-rendered intro cinematic that was largely cock all to do with the rest of the game. So I guess this is Deck 13's design philosophy. Hey, do you mind watching this video we threw together for a laugh while we finished nailing bread bins and bits of old pipe to the main character's armour. I was impressed by how the story successfully created the atmosphere of a new work environment though, because something's gone horribly wrong and no one seems to know why or who to blame. But it scarcely needs an explanation. The machines have all gone hostile, standard science fiction plot 14 alpha. The explanation is they needed to do that for there to be a video game. So we begin the usual Dark Souls pattern, gradually advance, explore, unlock shortcuts and get repeatedly smashed like an avocado in a sprinter's jockstrap. More so than in other Dark Souls likes I'd say. If it is a relatively short game then they may have compensated by cranking the difficulty up even higher than usual, so we have to creep forward square foot by agonising square foot, in case another concealed enemy jumps out from a blind corner and chomps your health bar up in two hits. But hey, if it's obnoxious difficulty that makes me like Dark Souls, then surely even more obnoxious difficulty can only make things better. Don't you try to catch me out with your earth logic, human. In the world of difficult games, there exists a hypothetical line which I like to call the Tropic of Fuckabout. It is defined as the point where high difficulty stops being a stimulating challenge and becomes merely fucking me about. The fact that we and most of the half-human enemies we face are basically scrapyards on legs and that the robotic enemies lean towards being flat geometric shapes on legs mean it's really hard to read their movements, especially in dark areas because for some breathtakingly arbitrary reason you can only turn your flashlight on when you're wearing a piece of body armour, and even then it's a miserable spot about sufficient to illuminate two thirds of the entity trying to shove a pneumatic drill up your nose. The best approach I found was to wade in and start mashing attack, not with a fast light weapon because I'd always come out of it with some health lost and a foot missing because apparently one of the enemy's indistinct movements might have been a stab, I'd use a heavy weapon I could be sure would stunlock them, and which only have a wind up time of about 900 million years, and locks you into long combo animations that might end with you comboing right off a fucking ledge into a pile of sharpened supermarket trolleys. None of which are impossible to compensate for, of course, this is all shit that can still be countered with the usual go-to advice for twats, get good, even the fucking horrible dodge mechanic where you have to flick the right analogue stick. I've said this before third person games, leave the right analogue stick alone to its happy little world of controlling the camera. You force it out of its comfort zone, it's just gonna piss on the bus seat and ruin the whole field trip. None of this was enough to bring out that hate I mentioned earlier. Frustration, yes, but frustration doesn't stop me from playing, it just means I'll need two diazepam and a wank once I'm done. The hate only came when I was taking on the third boss. It's a big industrial machine with about nine things on it trying to kill you, fair enough, but for some turbo-cocking reason, every time you attack one, the game auto-targets it, leaving you staring blissfully into its eyes as its eight friends are winding up attacks where you can't see. Get past that and I can start attacking the core, but if you target it, fucking switches to a fixed camera so I can barely see what I'm doing. What's got into you, camera? Is this about the pissing on the bus seat comment? Finally, after much frustration and about 900 attempts, I've gotten the core on the ropes and am moments from landing the final blow, whereupon I glitched through the floor and fall to my death. No, that's too much. That's gone right over the tropic of fuckabout on a jet ski full of dicks. I'm done. Fuck the surge, fuck deck 13, fuck anyone who likes it. Blimey, that's filled my schedule out for the week. I think it's fair to say that the DC Comics universe and its various adaptations could stand to take itself a touch less seriously. Oh, it's easy to be an armchair cinematographer, isn't it? Snarks Johnny DC in reply. You try getting in a cheery mood when your films need to break 400 million on opening weekend, or your executives will have to take a pay cut and cause the collapse of the local pool cleaning industry. I'm just saying, Johnny DC, that Superman and Batman crying in the rain, smashing each other's faces in and talking like pro 
wrestlers with mouthfuls of cat litter might be drifting somewhat from the essence of those characters, that is to say, power fantasies for little boys who don't want to tidy their rooms. But here's Injustice 2 anyway, another team up between the DC Universe and Nether Realm, the Mortal Kombat people. Although DC shouldn't feel special because the last Mortal Kombat game ended up crossing over with Alien, Predator, Jason Voorhees, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and basically everyone that ever replied to their emails, so I'd advise DC to get themselves down the clap clinic once they get back from the honeymoon. Still, as I believe I said last time, the one-on-one -on -one fighting game and the superhero comics universe are an actual combo, as both are concerned with larger-than-life characters beating the snot out of each other for one incredibly contrived reason after another. The broad incredibly contrived reason running through the Injustice property is a falling out between Batman and Superman over whether or not killing people is good. Batman takes the position that killing is the uncrossable line at which all negotiation breaks down and vigilance gives way to tyranny, while Superman takes the position that wow wow, I'm really sad and cross and I'm not going to tidy my room so there. After the events of the first game, Superman is in super prison until he jolly well does tidy his room, young man. Batman's trying to rebuild the world. Supergirl has turned up and is being misled by Wonder Woman, who had precisely none of Superman's motivation to turn evil, but did so anyway with about twice the gusto, because that's what happens when you let those slimy girls into the treehouse club, isn't it, lads? And to this big ball of nonsense comes a new threat in the form of Brainiac, planet-destroying one-man Borg collective and classic Superman villain, named presumably by someone who assumed they were writing an escapist fantasy for little boys and not a gritty apocalyptic horror epic. Injustice 2 takes a stark realistic art style that makes the main cast resemble a bunch of mums and dads escorting their kids to the cosplay convention and getting a little bit too into it. The highly realistic faces are breakfasting at the ski lodge overlooking the uncanny valley, especially when Black Canary does her screaming attack and she looks more like she stubbed her toe on a coffee table. But hey, all the realistic graphics in the world would go to waste the instant a fight actually starts and the two characters start boinging back and forth like a pair of hyperactive grasshoppers playing British Bulldog, and yet the obvious effort that went into making things look arse-achingly authentic is contrasted against a distinct lack of effort everywhere else. It's obvious that they've simply taken the basic skeleton of Mortal Kombat X and slotted different characters in. It uses the exact same pre-fight banter script. Character A says banter, character B says response banter, character A gets offended, commence hyperactive grasshopper business. Same camera angles, same elaborate animations every time. Gorilla Grodd always produces a skull and crushes it when delivering banter line 3. Where is he getting all these skulls from? Is there a little off-screen monkey slave with a big bag of the fuckers? Also, I wonder if some of the choices of D-list character editions might have been affected by what assets Netherrealm already had lying around. We had Killer Frost last time and now Captain Cold, I suspect because they'd already made a load of ice effects for Sub-Zero in the last Mortal Kombat game, who incidentally is also getting added to this game as DLC, which is an act of supreme redundancy. That is, at best, putting a cherry on top of another cherry that already had a cherry on it. I worry this sort of thing is going to turn into what Guitar Hero turned into, but with characters instead of songs. If you're just going to use basically the same bloody framework every time, why even bother making entirely new games when you can just keep adding downloadable characters to the existing ones? That's pretty much how Mugen works. Perhaps I should keep my ideas to myself, because I can faintly hear the sound of Warner Brothers executives hyperventilating. I'm still not a big fan of actually playing fighting games. It's for twitchy people who like inputting stupidly complex button combinations at very short notice, like a jazz pianist on myth. Tutorial doesn't help. Still got no idea what the fuck a bounce cancel is unless it's a surefire way to disappoint a children's party. I would think these five minute long super movies would break up the gameflow rather drastically. Maybe fighting game fans appreciate having a little time out to sip their coke and reset all their finger bones. But you know what? I've come to appreciate fighting games as a sort of bare bones exploration of characters. My favourite Batman villain is Scarecrow. Dunno why, maybe because his bits were the highlight of both Arkham Asylum and Batman Begins. Maybe because I bet no one ever gets all up in his grill for not liking Smash Brothers enough. And I admit I got a kick out of playing as him in this game and going through his tower mode and ending. Of course, before I could do that, I had to find the tower mode, and I don't make that easy. It's buried right at the bottom of multiverse mode, like a furtively stashed porn mag under a mattress. Multiverse mode, incidentally, is the method by which the game stacks up six or seven random unrelated fights and pretends you're achieving something. It's the long sought after missing link between gaming and data entry. The other main new feature is gear drops. Crack open your hard earned loot boxes and you'll be rewarded with a glove, a pocket square, and a sweatband for Dullard Woman and Captain Never Used, which ups their flouncing ability by 0.1%. This loot crate shit is an indictment of the times, especially since it's always so bloody successful, but it's not like unlocking a fun alternative costume where the Joker looks like how he looked in Landmark Issue 537 of Flouncy Comics. Most of the gear does very little to change the overall look of a character. Most of Superman's torsos are just a hundred variations on a theme of blue jumper with lines on it. So in terms of what I want out of a fighting game, Injustice 2 is cloyingly stupid. Watching the story mode and its increasingly contrived setups for a conveyor belt of fights in the same six or seven locations is like watching a school play with an irresponsibly extravagant budget. And incidentally, did everyone just forget that normal humans can't beat up superhumans on equal footing, or is that one of those things we weren't supposed to notice? But you know what? Injustice 2 is like a puppy chewing a fire extinguisher. Charming in its stupidity, but I'd rather watch it on YouTube than have it in my house. 
It's been a long, confusing journey, hasn't it, Platinum Games, which funnily enough also describes most of your fucking releases. There have been some strange turns, Bayonetta 2 exclusive to Wii U springs to mind, that was like a fucking modern art installation being exclusive to the Etcher sketch, but Platinum Games has finally joined us in the sun. First Bayonetta 1 gets a Steam release and everyone went, oh, okay, bit weird. We didn't particularly mind that being a console game, because it made it slightly easier to furtively hide when our mum burst into the room. Why don't you bring out a Steam version of that shooter you made? The one that became a bit of a cult hit and that's now sort of hard to find. What, you mean Anarchy Reigns? <laughs> <laughs> no. Obviously we're talking about Vanquish, which is highly suitable for release on PCs partly because it's a high-octane cover shooter, and partly because the main character spends the entire game wearing one. Obviously no one told the Vanquish dude not to wear a pure white suit of armour to a grimy battlefield, by rights he should have ended up looking like the floor of a sharehouse bathroom. The plot of Vanquish concerns Russia being evil. It was a little bit quaint at the time the game first came out, but has since somehow come back around to being relevant again. They take over an orbital death ray station with an army of death robots, and blow up San Francisco in a humanitarian effort to combat rising housing costs in California. But America take it the wrong way as always, and refuse to surrender, dispatching a bunch of marines to the death ray station to take it back. The main character is not a marine, but an employee of DARPA wearing a very expensive DARPA-developed suit of armour, because it's not like DARPA develops tech to be used by the military. No, that's why every tank and fighter plane has to be piloted by the nerd who developed it. Shush now everybody, the thing is, we're not actually supposed to be taking this plot seriously. So it is a shame that the Russia aspect has gotten itself all inconveniently relevant. There's always an undercurrent of irony in Platinum Games' stuff, although it's admittedly slightly subtler here than it is in, say, Bayonetta, the woman who routinely has to clean small children out of her armpits after they mistake her for a roller coaster. The main character smokes constantly to maintain the stereotypical grizzled badass image, but I think he only does so so he can dramatically flick cigarettes away when he's about to do things, because I don't think he ever got through more than a quarter inch of one. He's partnered for most of the game with Robert Burns, famous Scottish poet and author of Auld Lang Syne, here reimagined as a nine foot shaved bear of a man who's so grizzled he can peel potatoes by rubbing them on his chin. And as for badass, his ass is so bad it denies the Holocaust and fraudulently uses disabled parking spaces. So the two of them spend the entire game having an incredibly insecure grizzle off, the flashed young newcomer in his go-faster stripes versus the cynical old-timer wearing an entire double-decker bus, down on their knees competing to see who can suck the most gravel into their throats. There's also an attractive female support character, and whenever she's on screen the camera always seems to be one flicked cigarette away from pointing right up her skirt. It's all immensely silly stuff and par for the Platinum Games course. What makes Vanquish interesting is the combat mechanics. So obviously Vanquish set out to make a cover shooter, but after looking up what those were it asked, do we really have to plop ourselves down behind little walls so much? We exclusively make fast-paced games, because we have the attention span of a moth at a fireworks display. Then, after they were firmly told that yes, plopping down behind cover is a pretty essential part of a cover shooter, Vanquish went, could we maybe have the character breakdance behind cover rather than plop? Oh, and weird idea, rocket skates! Yes, apparently DARPA's jetpack research went nowhere, so they repurposed the tech to let you scoot along the ground like a fast-forward video of a dog with an itchy bum. And most of the combat takes place in big, wide-open arenas, so the emphasis is less on plopping down and more on dodging, changing position and managing your suit energy. Here's a little tip I discovered. If you switch weapons midway through a reload animation, the first weapon will be reloaded when you switch back to it in accordance with the principles of homeopathy, I think. Whatever, it keeps the pace up, but speaking of pace, one thing I could do without is the way you automatically go into slow motion when you're near death. Yeah, I know, it's to get yourself out of danger, but once you are, there's no way to turn it off again. So all you can do is let your suit energy run out and then pop a plop while you wait for it to come back. It's a bit of a pace killer, I thought we were avoiding plop. The last thing you want is for your game to become ploppy. I very much enjoy saying the word plop. Plop aside though, Vanquish's combat is generally a speedy and interesting take on the genre, what else has it got? What else? Damn it, we weren't prepared for this part of the interview! Quick, spawn 500 million identical robots! Yes, sadly, like a severely poorly maintained harp, the game's kinda one note. The entire thing takes place in the same environment, in probably oversized space station city that can't be bothered as much as throw a carpet down now and then, and you fight 10 million copies of the same robot that looks like a transformer that turns into a pink dildo. Everything that passes for a boss fight happens again at least twice, the story somehow gets from A to B while standing completely still, I sort of grasp that Burns doesn't care about innovation individual soldiers dying and the main bloke does, but demonstrate it another six or seven times just to be sure. At least he cares in cutscenes, not in gameplay because he's busy plopping. But hey, don't worry that the game doesn't evolve much because it's also really short so it won't bother you for long. All in all, if you're planning to buy Vanquish then make doubly sure you don't need the money for anything really important like medicine or a donation to the Republican Party, because it kind of feels more like a proof of concept than a complete game. A concept proved, certainly, you can have a fun cover shooter while you glide around on your back the whole time like a prostitute on a highly polished dance floor, but the time to develop the concept into something a bit meatier has long since passed, and now the game only exists is a sort of glimpse into a parallel universe where AAA shooters remembered that video games are supposed to be fun. That aside, Vanquish is also a PC port of a last generation game. So let's take a moment now to share our favourite bugs. That one where you took double damage if the game was running 60fps must have been a nightmare for hardcore PC gamers, for whom playing at 30fps is apparently like trying to breathe with a plastic bag on their head. The measure I was given to correct the bug added a whole bunch of exciting new ones, like on one level I kept falling through the floor and dying before the screen had faded in. Loading screen, pause, hideous dying scream, reload, repeat. It was like playing a blunt dramatisation of stillbirth. 
So here was the conundrum I found myself in, listener. E3 has come around again, and without my usual roundup of the show, it may inflict that most insidious of modern diseases, optimism. But at the same time, I kind of want to review Friday the 13th The Game, which I've been weirdly absorbed by lately, and I don't want to put it off another week, so what do I talk about? This nihilistic horror experience in which a lumbering, faceless idiot endeavours to bleed numerous young people dry, or Friday the 13th The Game? That's when I realised the answer was staring me in the face. All I have to do is review E3 using analogies to Friday the 13th The Game. So with that in mind, let's run down yet another handful of shows in which highly scrubbed people with earpieces and well-trained speaking voices attempt to get as excited about games as hackneyed and unoriginal as Friday the 13th The Game's map variety. What map shall we choose for the next round? The campsite on the lake, the other campsite on the lake, or if we feel like a change, the campsite on the lake but it's on the other side of the lake. In hardware news, Microsoft have updated Project Scorpio with a somehow even worse name, the Xbox One X. There's already two X's in Xbox, you dozy gits, this name is starting to look like a defaced game of tic-tac-toe, and I feel bringing it out alongside the Xbox One S is practically inviting the confused elderly relative on Christmas morning nightmare scenario, which never fails to be as disappointing as Friday the 13th The Game's lack of an option to bind push to talk to one of the controller buttons. Anyway, the Xbox XXXX, an essential purchase for people who like buying all new hardware every fucking year and lack the level-headed common sense of a demolition derby contestant, has a bunch of numbers attached that are apparently larger than the numbers of other consoles, but who the fuck cares, it's the games that count. The only teased Xbox exclusive that gave me any kind of tickle squirt was Crackdown 3, and even that rang alarm bells because Terry Crews was in it. And celebrities just scream distraction tactic, it's as distracting as the tendency of certain public Jason players to get into character by narrating all their actions in a furious comedy bellow. I'd turn voice chat off, but then I wouldn't be able to hear my fellow teammates calling me a cunt for not having a microphone set up. What it's crying out for is some kind of emote system, like maybe I could make an icon flash over my head indicating things like, yes I have some car keys, or no I am not available for sexual role playing. Just like the Sony presentation was crying out for some games we didn't already fucking know about. Yeah, new Spider-Man game, trying too hard to be a Batman Arkham game yet a fucking gen. There's got so many quick time events it's like watching a Transformers movie while programming a microwave. Yeah, new David Cage game about emotionless robots with only vague ideas on how to act human. Fuck, great idea, David Cage, play to your strengths. Yeah, new God of War, which by the looks of it is 10% actual gameplay and then more cinematic set pieces than Friday the 13th has hilarious physics fuck-ups that make ragdolls bounce out of kill animations like they're just really excited to be getting a fresh start on their new life as a corpse. Old Man Nintendo had a better showing, although that Mario vs. Rabbids game makes you wonder if Ubisoft is trying to steal their pension checks. Fair play to them, Mario Odyssey needed a new angle and it found one. They've done Mario Becomes a Raccoon, they've done Mario Becomes a Cat, but they've never done Mario Becomes a Tunnel brain parasite. What is it about Mario Odyssey that screams Sonic 2006 at me? Must be the cartoon characters interacting with realistically proportioned humans, which is always faintly sinister, like Christopher Lloyd's scenes in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But fuck all that, because splice my urethra, Nintendo were working on a game entitled Metroid Prime 4. That's literally all we know, the title. This is where one of those shit game journalists would say, let's stay optimistic. But this is Nintendo we're talking about. They've shown a bigger grudge against Metroid fans than I have against playing as Jason's with a fast swim ability when you need to swim about as often as a cat made of soluble aspirin. So let's talk third party. Oh boy, another bloody open world action game featuring wilderness exploration and where the player can decide what approach to take, meaning they will choose stealth followed by direct assault after the stealth fucks up. And in the spirit of player choice, you may now choose what game I'm talking about. Far Cry 5, Days Gone, or Anthem. They really have given up on making gameplay videos that don't seem totally scripted. The people they got to voice the open quotes players of the Anthem open quotes gameplay video sounded like they were trying to unwind after a hard day appearing in David Cage games. And of course there's Assassin's Creed, emerging from its hiatus, waving its arms and yelling, we figured out where our incredibly cluttered unfocused gameplay design was going wrong. What people really want is incredibly cluttered unfocused gameplay design with the minimap taken off. Pre-order now for an exclusive golden bow with a fucking knob on the end or something, whatever. The annual E3 Bet You Thought We Were Hoping You'd Forgotten About This award this year goes to Beyond Good and Evil 2. Although sadly all they had was a pre-rendered trailer which as we know only tells us three things, jack, fucking, and shit. Speaking of which, what's with all the fucking profanity? It's funny animal people pulling merry pranks on cartoonish fist-shaking villains in an upbeat sci-fi universe. Seems ideal, family friendly fair, but everyone's effing like a sailor who showed up last for the queue outside your mum's house. It makes as much sense as Friday the 13th the stamina mechanics. Standing under light makes stamina recover faster, what is Jason mad at us for drinking all his chlorophyll? Star Wars Battlefront 2 is pulling what's known as the Titanfall gambit, make full price multiplayer only game, add single player campaign to sequel then expect praise for it, like a player who wastes a shotgun shell on Jason in the first five minutes when there's nothing to distract him from. A Way Out is a narrative game that's co-op only. Oh you blighted industry with the long term memory problems of a combat focused player character attempting to repair the car. Linear narrative focus and multiplayer have never worked together. You can't get immersed in a story's universe when there's a human next to you acting as constant reminder of the real world. And that title is asking for trouble from snarky critics. A way out, I certainly wanted one. In conclusion, Friday the 13th the game is like most one versus group multiplayer games in that it's basically hide and seek with extra steps, but the core rules of it create enough effective suspense to draw me in despite its lack of polish and slight problem with random players acting like twats. Meanwhile, E3 has all the polish in the world and is a fucking twat safari. So that's the final comparison. Jason sucks down damage 
hacks up kids, E3 damages kids and sucks off hacks. 